Great. So in this session, um, this is a, a joint session between the climate finance team and the adaptation technologies team, uh, in which we are exploring technologies to help us mobilize more funds for adaptation and increase the role of the private sector. One of the objectives that we are looking towards achieving from this session is how can technologies uh, support us to build, be build better accountability and transparency of climate finance um, that will better enable uh, adaptation action at the front lines. Um, well, this is how we are going to run the agenda. Um, it's workshop mode. We hope to hear a lot from the participants, but we'll have three Ignite speeches that will speak to technology approaches. Um, and, and, and Chris is going to speak to that, but please. After the Ignite speeches, we hope to go into breakout groups for 30 minutes where we will tap into your experience and wisdom to contribute to this session. And finally, we'll come back to the plenary group and report back, but also speak to the key messages that we want to put out to the world as a community of practice after this session. So over to you, Chris, um, to tell us more about the objectives and the next session. Chris. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Um, can we have the last slide? So we still got the, there we are. Um, so I'm Chris Henderson. I am the Head of Agriculture and Practical Action. A lot of our work is related to uh, adaptation and, and farming that works for smallholder farmers. Um, the <clears throat> Two years ago, uh, adaptation technology was picked up by the CBA as one of the means of implementation of uh, climate action. And we've been exploring it and uh, it's been really interesting and really successful. I think there's almost no debate that, you know, uh, it's a given adaptation technology works. Um, it's, a, it's a given that, the, uh, that we need more finance. Um, th these, these are givens, but the problem we end up with is that we have uh, projects working probably, and in those projects you've got a, you know, an island of excellence, but it's in a sea of chaos. So the challenge for CBA 14 in the adaptation technology theme is how can we bring about systemic change? How can we move these islands of excellence into um, change at scale, adaptation at scale, in countries which are being impacted by climate change so that it works for everybody and it works for community-based adaptation. So that's the challenge of the adaptation technology theme. The challenge in this session is, so we have these givens. We know we need to address the adaptation financing gap. That's known, it's been talked about for a long time. We know that technologies work, but what can we, how can we sort of tap this now to identify the barriers to the uptake of uh, adaptation technologies and promote, promote investment uh, and innovation um, by, you know, with, through, with our help as practitioners and, and find these solutions. So that is it. How can we mobilize funds for adaptation and increase the role of the private sector and bring about change at scale? So throughout this session, let us remember that and when we have our breakout groups and when we have our reporting back and when we have our discussion and think of our action points, we're thinking about this objective. So thank you. With that, let's have a quick look at who's going to present in the next 15 minutes. That's the next slide. Um, so we have three exciting presentations. We've got one, uh, which I think is really exciting, a fail forward experience, learning from failure. It's talked about so little, there's a great experience from Vietnam that we can learn from about how uh, maybe develop, we can develop the business case for public money uh, using technology and using that as a pool. The second one is turning more to what private investors might do. Smallholder farmers are themselves private investors. Agriculture is a private sector. 
Maria is going to talk about that. Uh, and then Ma Matthew will pull it together, uh, looking at the potential of digital and mobile applications with examples for CBA and will challenge us about how innovative we can be uh, in bringing forward solutions that work and in finance and investment that works. I'm going to hand over to Nya and then uh, Susan will complete facilitating this. Thank you. Nya. Thanks, Chris. Um, good afternoon from, from Vietnam. So I am Nga and I'm currently leading strategic partnerships at Care International in Vietnam. So my pleasure today to share with you our fail forward experience with Allo Weather. Uh, what I am sharing might be helpful for those who are developing business cases or business model to scale adaptation technologies and specifically climate information services. Next, please. So, um, so Allot Weather is uh, an initiative that aims to develop a fee-for-service model where poor farmers will pay for weather forecasts and advisories um, through interactive SMS and voice messages. The forecasts and advisories are supposed to be locally relevant accessible and actionable and based on the success of a number of climate uh, information service projects that care implemented in Vietnam um, we had very bold ambition that allow whether would do development differently um, we would be able to expand our impact um, our reach and support um, yeah, a lot of poor rural farmers um, but the critical question is that um, whether it is viable to turn a strong development project into a business model. Um, how about we taking into account all factors to make it work? Next, please. Next, please. Um, yes, and um, you know, we, we had one year from August 2018 to September 2019 to explore test and validate our weather model. We aim to reach 4,000 farmers in one province first um, before expanding to other location. Um, but um, the pilot was not successful as we had anticipated. And this is because first, when we move away from paper-based and traditional channels to disseminate climate information to SMS and voice messages, um, the cost um, skyrocketed. Our initial promise was around 18 cents per message, but the actual final cost was uh, 95 cents per message. Second, our customers who are mainly ethnic minority smallholder farmers are not willing to pay. They are only able to pay around 20 to 40 cents per message and this is less than half of the actual cost. And third, given people's unwillingness to pay and the complexity of the business model which involves so many stakeholders, we, um, we could not scale our work. Why we initially target 4,000 farmers, only 1,700 people participated. Fourth, as we transmitted the advisories um, in SMS format, um, the content um, did not appear to be legible for end user because uh, um, the SMS message lacks the tones that we often have in the Vietnamese language. And last but not least, um, we didn't see the interest from any private sector to invest in the model. We actually, to, we actually had to pay quite high fee for a mobile network operator to transmit the advisory. And they said that the, the project is too small scale. Um, it is not commercially viable to invest in. Next, please. Um, so, yeah, so this, um, so the fundamental question is that what should be the best financing model to scale up climate information services or to support adaptation technologies? And obviously from the, the Vietnam context and, and, and the context of Alok Weather, we see that the funding from NGO is not enough. We would need public funding to help to scale up this good work or a PPP, a public-private 
um, partnership model might be an option as the private company would need the support from the government to share the risk when they make investment in this area. In other contexts, it could be yeah, private funding alone. There is no one size fits all solution for this. And you need to work in advance how you define the best financing model for your program or, or project forward. Again, what is the best financing model for climate information technology? I would like to open that question for further discussion in the breakout group. So thank you. Thank you, Nya. That was uh, brilliant. I mean, it is great, isn't it? Moving uh, the sort of theory into practice and discovering what needs to be done. And clearly there is a case for strategic investment, but it probably has to be from public funding. Um, let's move to the next Ignite presentation. So Maria, it's over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's good morning from Zimbabwe. Good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I just want to start off by giving you a bit of a background and uh, this will be um, facilitated by that rhetorical question. How can you use the sun to turn a dry wasteland into a rich greenland? Uh, when I had a conversation with a group of farmers you're seeing there, their answer was that uh, it takes uh, a lot of hard work, passion for the land, and of course, uh, leaning on the indigenous knowledge systems and the technologies which have been passed on from generation to generation to the current uh, crop of farmers. But that used to be okay uh, in the past before the advent of the climate change and its impacts. So the farmers used to rely also from a bit of help from the rain itself. But due to the climate change now, uh, the areas you can see there are in the left-hand corner there, that's a group of farmers, NOMSA, and their group of uh, farmers and the community. It used to be a wasteland, but then uh, we came in working with the communities and other strategic partners, uh, practical action then came in with solar irrigation. Uh, solar power derogation. Next slide, please. So we've had uh, a bit of experience uh, over the years on solar power irrigation, And the question now is how can we use that solar powered irrigation to leverage private sector investment in climate change adaptation so that small, small older farmers and remote communities uh, can benefit. The lady you're seeing there is Irene. She's uh, among the other group of farmers um, in the communities where we work. Uh, these are areas which are dry, uh, natural, and they are also very remote uh, from city centers. So from the geographic location and also the dryness and the hotness and the low rainfall, the farmers now are facing major challenges to be productive. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So basing on the um, context of which area where we are going in, practical action then works with the communities and strategic government and other um, uh, local leaderships to try and develop technologies which respond to a particular need. So at times we come in with standalone solar powered irrigations, which then transport water from open water sources into an overnight uh, storage unit and then channeled to the um, areas of cropping. Then we also have solar farms which also work similarly and in Zimbabwe we uh, practical action with the partners has come up with um, one of the largest mini grids uh, in the country, a hundred kilowatt mini grid which is uh, offering power to um, 30 groups of farmers and each group of farmers is comprised of about 30 to 40 individuals and then they are also powering schools, uh, clinics, hospitals and the residential areas. So that that is uh, some of the experience we have and it has helped to turn around 
um, the bleak areas of non-production. And when you're looking at the farmer, if you look at Nomsa holding a horse by the, she says that for us, this is a source of livelihood. This is life for us in the middle of almost a desert. And if you look at Solomon and Edmore there, they are also very proud to be part of this and very grateful that this intervention was brought into their area because now they are able to uh, meet food security and also to have uh, alternative sources of income. Can we move to the next slide, please? So like I said, uh, Practical Action has over 20 years of experience uh, in solar powered irrigation. And the experience has taught us that solar technology does have great potential to turn around um, areas which have no hope and to bring a lot of hope to the local communities, especially those who are marginalized and who are off the national grid in terms of even receiving uh, government um, you know, programs because they are too far placed and also very remote. And the technologies in terms of uh, mobile services and social media is also very low. So solar technology brings in a lot of potential from uh, various angles for the farmers. The farmers themselves, uh, they are indeed private sector as well, but they lack the resources to invest and to scale up. What they are able to do is using the technologies which will be there, they are able to repair and maintain uh, these technologies which practical shed would have brought in, but they don't have the capacity to invest into scaling up so that it goes on uh, beyond the areas. So what do we need to do to give investors confidence so that they can also uh, bring in some money to flow towards these uh, solar powered irrigation schemes? And what else can we do to strengthen the ability of these vulnerable people so that they can use these technologies to cope with hazards, de uh, disasters, and also to achieve food security? Uh, can you please move to the next slide? Thank you. So that is the question which uh, we hope you'll be able to help us uh, answer when we have uh, the break breakout sessions. What do we need to do to attract uh, more and better private sector investment, which is coordinated in a way that even the vulnerable and most marginalized communities can also benefit? And also, how can we excite and interest private sector to invest in the power of the sun? Thank you. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Maria. <clears throat> A real and challenging question if we want to move out of these islands of excellence and these projects which are supported perhaps by donor funds but actually make it systemic change. We know this technology works uh, but uh, the system hasn't changed yet so that it's available for everybody. Matt, can you um, give us the, a perspective from digital and mobile technologies? Sure, good morning everyone. Um, as a quick introduction, my name is Matt Wilson and I lead the research activities for the GSMA's clean tech team. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the GSMA, we're a global industry organization that works on behalf of over 750 mobile operators um, and another 400 organizations in the technology sector. And as an organization, we're really passionate about helping the mobile industry advance the sustainable development goals and finding ways for digital technology to deliver transformational impact uh, for the, the people and communities that need it most. And in our team's first report, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, called Digital Dividends and Natural Resource Management, we looked at over 130 projects from low and middle income countries that are actively deploying digital technology. And we found that transformational impact can be achieved when digital technology is used to do uh, or to support three key activities. The first being real-time monitoring and data collection. The second being data management and analysis. And then the third one, which I think is most interesting to this group and conversation is engaging with local communities. And by that, we mean influencing positive behaviors, providing communities with the tools they need to actively participate in natural resource management or access information and support, um, or delivering payments for ecosystem services. 
Um, and the report also highlights the benefits of working together in partnerships. So we found that initiatives that are supported by technology organizations, such as mobile operators, are twice as likely to leverage emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, um, IoT, or connected devices, um, and blockchain. And a key takeaway for us is that while digital solutions can be cost effective and effective tools for community engagement, many challenges still need to be addressed. Uh, and this includes community access to technology, especially smartphones and community digital skills, trust between stakeholders and any risks associated with sharing information. For instance, possible harm that can come from local to local community members when they're reporting illegal activities. Uh, and then also the need to build technical expertise within donor agencies, governments, nonprofit organizations, and community organizations. So on the next slide, to give you um, a, a bit of flavor on how we're seeing the private sector and technology organizations engaging in this space, I've included a bit of information on a few case studies from our report. And I'll have to go through these quickly, so I would encourage you to look at the report if you want to see more details about these projects. But the first one to mention is a project in Malaysia and the Philippines supported by Ericsson called Connected Mangroves. Uh, and the project is implemented in coastal communities that have traditionally struggled to grow mangrove trees that survive to maturity. And the project uses low cost sensors to monitor a wide range of environmental conditions that affects the tree growth and feeds this information right back to community members on a digital dashboard that's accessed on any device that has um, internet connectivity. And the project has seen survival rates increase from 30% to 80%. They've seen um, biodiversity increase, improved livelihoods, and the community's really taken ownership of the data collection process. Uh, on the next slide, I highlight the Rainforest Foundation's ForestLink project. And this project trains local community members to monitor the forest using simple mobile applications that capture and allow them to report really simply using SMS um, illegal activities or threats to the forest. And those SMS alerts are then sent to law enforcement authorities and local governments and NGOs to help inform their response um, to combat those illegal activities. And the Rainforest Foundation has found that working directly with local communities in this way not only helps reduce monitoring costs and inefficiencies, it also improves forest governance. Um, on the next slide, there's a similar project run by the Rainforest Foundation in the US that's using blockchain technology to track, verify, and reward communities for protecting and um, regenerating forests. So similar to the last project I described, community, community members patrol a designated area using their traditional methods and investigate deforestation and legal activities um, that are reported using the Global Forest Watch system. Um, and the community actions are verified using satellite data and then rewards in the form of payments are dispersed into community accounts. So on the next slide, just to close, and again, I know that this is a, sort of a whirlwind tour of three projects, but um, I think it helps, helps you understand how technology is being used. But to close, when thinking about how technology can improve investors and users' confidence in data collection and sharing, which obviously supports uh, payments, um, these three case studies and the many others that we've explored provide us with three key lessons. First is you have to get your incentives right. So the right incentives foster conservation mindsets and increase community ownership of these projects. Um, the second one is that added benefits and additional sources of truth can be gained by pairing multiple technologies at once. Um, and then the final is that local participation in solution design is really critical. So we believe that you need to build data collection and payment tools that leverage local knowledge and approaches and are designed with that end user in mind. So just to close, our view is that, um, and this is one that we'll be testing this year, is if you create conservation mindsets among local communities, you if you create tools for them to participate effectively in climate action, then opportunities for private sector partnerships and more equitable and transparent climate financing will follow. So I'll close there and um, looking forward to discussing this more in the breakout sessions. Thanks. Matt, thank you very much. I mean, there's so many things you were saying in there that I think are almost worthy of a session in themselves, you know. You talked about how you use this technology to get rewards and uh, financial benefits back to communities for relevant actions. That was really exciting. And the other one about local participation being critical and using these tools 
I mean, I don't think we could agree more, but this probably needs unpacking a lot more, which means that we're on time now. I can hand over to Susan, who will explain the breakout groups um, and how we might try and unpack this a little more. Thank you. Susan. And Lynn, it's next slide, please. Susan, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, my network just acted up a little. I'm glad I, I got back just on time. Okay, so um, thank you to the Ignite speeches that is uh, launching us into the breakout group. Now, we are not taking questions in plenary, but I'd like to encourage the, the speakers to respond to any questions of clarity in the chat in the chat room at any point like Nia has just done. So we are going to spread out into different groups to speak to these questions. And um, you probably already are familiar with this. Uh, Lynn will, will, I think it is Lynn, we, will be setting us up into the different groups, you will find both a facilitator and rapporteur. So just be comfortable to speak and share experiences on how we can develop technologies. No, how can development, sorry, how can technology developers be incentivized to help with community-based adaptation and how can we improve the business case for public funds and business models for individuals, communities, and private sector sector investors. Um, I think the, the Ignite speeches have emphasized um, findings in the IPCC that these technologies work, but we need to scale them up. So we, we would like you to share your experience and tap into your wisdom so that we can shape the how in um, this regard. You see what we were exploring. Um... So hopefully that's okay. And Harrison, thank you so much. Let's just put our two questions into the chat. So we'll come to those in just a minute. Um, Charlotte, I know that you're online and with us. I am, again, apologies if I've got your name wrong, please do correct me. Um, Charlotte, do, um, do you, would you like to maybe introduce yourself and tell us your interest in the, in the topic? Sure. Um, so my name is Charlotte Hicks. I work with the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Centre. Um, I'm based in Thailand. Um, I have construction outside my house, so I apologise in advance for the noise. Um, and uh, I work a lot on ecosystem-based adaptation, nature-based solutions. Um, I'm interested in how these can be used together with community-based adaptation and, and different types of digital technologies uh, and whether that opens up new sources of, of resources or new market opportunities, I guess. Mm. Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Abby, welcome. Abby, are you able to switch your... Um, apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Are you able to switch on your... You're, I'll unmute you. It'd be lovely to see you. Um, I can't, how would I unmute you? I don't know how to mute you. Yeah, it'd be lovely to hear a little bit about you if you're able to share. No. Ayan, are you able to introduce yourself? Hello. Hi. Hello, hi. Hi, how are you? Hello. Yeah, I'm sorry, I lost the connection. No problem. Yeah, do keep the video off if you've got a poor connection. I am. Tell us um, where you're, where you're calling us from, and um, tell us a bit about your interest in the in the topic. Yeah, so I am from the Philippines. I am actually from the Philippine Red Cross. Um, I work on a project related to the integration of disaster risk. And reduction, climate change adaptation, and ecosystem-based management and 
uh, restoration. So I'm very much interested in the topic on how um, we can um, look for other funding opportunities and how we can um, explore other funding opportunities for us to sustain our um, different strategies and uh, interventions or measures on climate change, disaster risk reduction uh, measures, and also uh, environment. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Abu, I don't know if you're able to to connect on the audio. No. Harrison, I know that you're our rapporteur, so you're you're sort of taking notes, but would you like to introduce yourselves as well and tell us a little bit about your interest in the topic? And do feel free to join the conversation as well. Um, thanks very much, Belinda. So yeah, I do have a passion about how um, digital technologies can uh, assist um, with uh, adaptation and working together with uh, nature-based uh, solutions. Um, so currently, um, I think I've been working with uh, Maria and Chris, uh, whom you might know from the main session, um, but I'm based here in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe in particular. And uh, I'm really keen in learning, you know, about the different innovations that are happening around the world. And uh, if we can also incorporate that in the work we do. Thank you. Fantastic. So we've got two questions, um, which Harrison's kindly put into the chat, um, which I'd love to, we, we can cover both. I mean, they're obviously related, or we can really focus on one. Could you tell me which you'd like to focus on? So the first one, the second one, or both? Maybe put it in the chat if it's quicker. So I guess that's Harrison, Charlotte, Ayan, and Abu, if you're able to participate. Which of the two questions are you most interested in? One, two, or both? If you could answer in the chat. Okay, I've just put my answer in the chat. Great. Question one. And question two. Okay, let's go for both. Let's, let's, so let's start with question one, number one. So I guess it's interesting to draw on the presentations that we've just heard, but obviously bring in your own experience. So let's start with how can technology developers be incentivized to help with, with community-based adaptation? What are your thoughts on this? Or what have you seen work? What experience have you got that you can share? And that's to anybody on the, in the group. We currently work with various tech companies and technology developers um, and some of them are provided, you know, they provide support as part of their corporate social responsibility or because they have a certain interest in this. I'm thinking of some of the work that Google Earth Engine does, for example. Um, but I'm also wondering if the question is partly, what's the word I'm looking for here, if it should be framed in a slightly different way in that what are we looking for? Are we looking for tech developers to continue to provide access to certain services um, pro bono or are we looking for opportunities to make this more um, market-based so that you can find tech that meets your needs at an affordable price that it's replicable um, that it's uh, you, you go to a tech developer and you're able to get something that fits your needs at a, at a cost-effective price um, yeah <laughs> that's interesting I wonder if there's a third aspect to the question as well whether the, the, the third aspect in, in is that having a tech developer being involved actually opens up other fine funding opportunities as well. I 
Shut up. Maybe, maybe with for some of the really big companies and the big platforms, they have their own grant making schemes, for example, um, yeah. apply to us and show us a, a new way of using our platform or our data. Um, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an imbalance because you, you have the really large scale big applications, um, but then often what you might work best in a community is not necessarily some fancy new Google Earth application, but rather something um, much more tailored or much smaller and much cheaper to develop. And most of, when we do things involving technology that we're paying for out of our project budgets or that you know, we're not going to the really big developers, we're trying to work with local I think we might have lost Charlotte. I think Charlotte, that your second point was there that you work with local developers. You try and work with local developers, not just the big tech players. Well, it's the local um, uh, innovators and technology developers. So I guess we could be looking at both, uh, but obviously the, 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 the different, you know, categories of technology developers might have um, different issues affecting them. Um, then maybe my contribution looking at the, you know, more local technology developers that are not so established or financed like uh, Google and others, maybe governments might consider I'm so sorry, my internet connection's being dreadful. So Harrison, I know that you were sharing something, but I missed it. I'm so sorry. I don't know if other people- No, no problem. I don't know what impact my poor connection's having on the dialogue. Uh, I heard it as well. Um, sorry, everyone's having techn technology <laughs> problems today, which is very fitting. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think also, we probably should be doing more to support local tech developers. Like Harrison said, there's, um, uh, there might be some opportunities there to um, improve infrastructure or, or to improve their access to, to skills or to other, to other aspects. Um, I, I think whenever we're doing these new, um, technology platforms or applications, it would be great if they were all in country, locally led. Um, and it's not always easy. Um, we do stuff that happens at a global scale, um, like uh, UN Biodiversity Labs, for example. Um, but I think the emphasis is getting more and more on how can you actually use these at a at a local scale and COVID has been forcing us to experiment more with this, but it is something that it, it kind of forced us to do it. Um, we weren't using that much digital technology to try and connect with communities or, or local stakeholders before. Um, we're trying to do so now, but it, it's been done in a very ad hoc way. Um, and I, I'm, I, I don't know how useful the sort of proliferation of digital platforms has been for local communities in the last six months, um, how many of them really are getting to access them and use them. Um, it's something that is very present in my world on my desktop. <laughs> A million different technologies and platforms and applications. Uh, I don't know how present it is for you know our, our partners in different countries and this is something I'm curious about as well. Um, 
we're all talking about how amazing it's been this transition to a, a remote virtual world, but how is it actually working out for um for everyone else? Yeah, absolutely. Ayan, I don't know if you have any thoughts or experience in response to that. Yeah, I actually agree with uh, both Harrison and Charlotte. Um, we have a uh, um, new um, technology innovations coming um, in, in this year in um, how are these technologies and these innovations can be used in remote areas, for example. Um, we have um, here in the Philippines, um, um, internet, particularly the social and internet, particularly social media, is being used um, to um, in different um, areas of the Philippines in um, rural communities, as it serves as their um, um, information to get the data on the uh, weather system, weather reports, or disasters and um, other news alerts, of course, that, that's uh, given to any country. But however, there are still communities where they cannot access or they don't have access to these kinds of technology. So um, how can we really um, put this into um, or provide this to different communities as well? So I think that's um, that's it. And how even if we have this um, available funding and local um, technology uh, developers, um, we still need to really um, um, have the community communities be educated in how to use these technologies because it's um, advanced, very advanced to them. Yeah. So sort of reflecting back on, on question one before we go and have a look at more at question two. So there's obviously issues when, you know, it's not straightforward as finding a technology developer and then, then everybody plugs in and, and you know, everything's a success. But at the same time, there's something about how do we even incentivize technology, technology developers in the first place to help with community-based adaptation? What do if we were to think about maybe what the you know the incentives are that we've seen work? What what are those incentives that help technology developers get involved? Whether that's local developers or the global players. Um, I mean, going back to what I was saying before, I unless you're looking for a um, a sort of um, development assistance type thing. I think most technology developers are service providers, so they get paid to develop tech. Um, I, I don't know how often um, people are working with technology developers who are, um, who are working in terms of, who, who need to be incentivized. Um, that, I guess that's my question. <laughs> so the question is, do they actually need to be incentivized? Yeah, or do you, do you just find one and pay, pay him or her to do something? <laughs> um, Harris. Uh, yeah. yeah. Harris. Uh, maybe, okay. Uh, can I come in, Belinda? Please do. Oh, okay. Um, so I think I'm um, picking up from uh, both um, your points um, and I guess what I'm understanding is that uh, um, whilst we appreciate that large companies already do provide tech as part of their um, CSR, um, not many might be doing it, you know, in the community-based uh, adaptation kind of uh, initiatives. So I guess maybe we could help those large um, uh, tech companies see the potential social impact and value of um, uh, digital technologies within within adaptation so that would you know help us um, draw some of that corporate social responsibility towards more uh, community-based adaptation um, initiatives and then um, for for the local technology developers um, or looking at um, the situation in the in the country, I guess for, for the smaller uh, 
guys in the market, I guess the issue of uh, it, you know, being uh, their livelihood is, is actually the, the reality. So a lot of tech uh, developers out there are, are actually looking for opportunities. Some come knocking on the doors of, you know, NGOs and CSOs and, you know, offering themselves. But, you know, sometimes, you know, there's that lack of um, uh, 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 appreciation maybe in, in within NGOs in terms of you know uh, how they can strike partnerships with these with these local um, technology developers. So you find that it's not really catered for in their budgets, and um, very few instances where you actually see partnerships you know between the local tech developers and and NGOs and CSOs um, here in 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 the south. But yeah, I guess yeah, I guess that's what I can say. Thank you. Mm. Really interesting, thank you. So should we look at question two, which is how can we improve the business case for public funds and business models for individuals, communities and private sector investors? What thoughts do you have on that? Ayan, shall I come back to you? or anybody who wants to jump in on that, how can we, so the question number two, how can we improve the business case of public funds and business models for individuals, communities and private sector investors? We're talking about the business case for investing in technology for adaptation. Yeah, so it's about how do we use, it's a slightly convoluted question, isn't it? So how can we improve the business case of public funds and business models for individuals, communities and private sector investors? Yes, to invest in technology. So I guess, yeah, this, this looks like a question that keeps recurring in most of the sessions. <laughs> And um, yeah, I, I, I do admit um, we, there, there isn't much you know, evidence to show the, the potential impact of uh, some of these nature-based uh, solutions and community-based adaptation technologies. Because you know, if it were really clear you know, how, how improved capacity to monitor natural resources would you know um, translate or you know generate you know impact on people's lives the environment in the long run i guess if we could consolidate you know some of the um, little evidence that is there and you know build up on it and you know make it more extensive i guess probably people who have the skills and uh, capacities would uh, really see the value of um, channeling that into such solutions. Mm. And you to add, sorry. That's you. I was just going to add to that. Um, I mean, the evidence base is really important. And I think the situation is starting to change. There are, there are a lot more people working on collecting this evidence base. Um, I mean, I think last week there was a review that came out of over 400 different examples. Uh, different um, cases of, of nature-based solutions um, showing how effective they were. Um, and, and so you're starting to see also um, organizations or uh, countries trying to embed this sort of monitoring and evaluation into their existing m and &E frameworks. Um, so as Harrison says, the evidence base is really important and it's getting better, I think. Um, I think maybe one of the missing pieces is how do you translate that evidence base into the types of questions that uh, public sector or private sector might be asking in order to make a decision about an investment. Um, so how do you take the evidence base and for something that's often very locally specific, um, ecosystem specific, tech specific, and how do you turn it into something that speaks to the specifications that they might be thinking about. Um, it reminds me, there was a case in Germany uh, where they were, ha they were asking the same sort of thing, why aren't uh, public sector agencies investing as much in ecosystem-based solutions? 
Uh, I think they made a rule that you um, they had to consider them. So when they were looking at uh, a proposal for infrastructure, for example, they had to consider the grey option and the green option, and they had to use the same sort of specifications for both. Um, and yeah, so the, I, it's, I think maybe if you can present your your option um, using the same sorts of, of specifications that they would normally be considering to guide an investment, then that mm. might help as well. Yeah. And do you think there's a role for technology in helping with that, almost that translation and that framing of to match the specification can is there a role or what is the role of technology in that bit from taking that evidence and, and linking it directly to the specification oh i don't know <laughs> um, um yeah i think i think there's a strong link um there um if you look at technologies like you know gis um analytics technology um, I think the development world can benefit a lot from that in terms of generating the evidence base as well as um, presenting the evidence to investors and, and, and policy makers. Um, but I really don't know how, how we can initially attract, you know, uh, those kinds of skills into our development work or maybe those kinds of partnerships um, because yeah, I, I do believe technology has a role to play in, in strengthening that evidence base as well as communicating the evidence. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. I think there was some research going on, for example, on looking at uh, particular ecosystems and how you would translate the thresholds in those ecosystems into engineering language, into engineering specs. Um, um and and things like that um i mean really old example is economic valuation we've been doing that for a long time translating certain types of costs and benefits into monetary <laughs> costs and benefits yes. um and like harrison said using gis spatializing things um so that you are showing um the locations and potential impacts within uh, a map against other spatial layers maybe that people are, are using. Really interesting. Gosh, it's, yes, there's a, there's a lot to be talked about. Um, we, I, and I'm gonna come back to you in just a moment. So I realize that I've not come to you for a little while. Um, we, when we go back into the, the plenary, um, we've been asked to provide just a, a really short report if you like um of the kind of like the two or three key three key things that that can be done in either one or both of those in response to one or both of those questions um who would like to do that ian and it's only two minutes Charlotte, would you like to do that or should we get Harrison to do it? Because Harrison, I've been taking notes. Are you still there? <laughs> one of us will have to um, just give a feedback or one or two key highlights from our discussions. Yeah, I, I see she's back. Welcome back, Melinda. Yeah, I'm sorry, this never happened. The weather we get a storm, and I don't know what's happened. Um, yeah, exactly as you say, Harrison. So, if one of you wouldn't mind, um, it's just two minutes, just presenting back. You know, two or key, two, three key insights in response to either one or both questions. Okay, I'm just gonna paste our notes in the chat box so you guys can uh, review those and also maybe can help in, in preparing for the feedback. Harrison, if nobody else is putting up their hand, are you okay to do that? 
Um, yeah, I can do that. That'll be fine. Thank you. So maybe I can just um, um, uh, do a test run of that and uh, you guys can give me your feedback maybe before we go back if there isn't anybody else with an additional point. So I guess I guess maybe the main thing that came out of the first question was that um, we need to appreciate the two different levels of technology developers who might have different needs. Um, but I guess the direct response that was that um, either governments or donors might need to um, chip in, uh, for instance, in infrastructure that helps local and remote communities uh, have better access to, to the technologies. Um, I guess that was the key point there. Um, under the second question, uh, there's the obvious thing about evidence, but I guess importantly, how do we, since you know things are beginning to change, evidence is beginning to show up, um, but we also need to consider how do we translate the evidence base into you know the particular questions that um, public or private sector uh, need uh, answered so that they can make investment or policy decisions. And maybe colleagues, you can chip in if I miss something. Absolutely. Sure. That looks great. Charlotte, Ian, thank you so much for joining. Have you got any, we've got to get chucked out for a few seconds, any quick other thoughts or questions? Thank you so much for being part of the conversation. I really appreciate it and sorry about the, the connectivity issues. Thanks, no Belinda. Worries. See you in the other room. All right. See you. Great. Okay, we are really fortunate in the sense that in this session, um, there's only about four, less than 50 people. So we are only six. And so we can have a really interactive discussion. Um, first of all, I'm proposing we have a quick round of introductions. We say who we are, where we are, uh, what we do, but we'll keep it to one minute each. Um, and we've got these two questions. Uh, we'll be, I think we'll have time to look at them both. So uh, I'm Chris, as I've said already, I'm Chris Henderson, I work for Practical Action, I'm Head of Agriculture here. I'm supporting projects across Africa, Asia and Latin America. So I've got my finger in too many pies, but it's really exciting, I can say that. Um, Clement, can you introduce yourself? Of course, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Clemence. Um, I'm a session support you know, for this conference based in London. Thanks, Clemens. Uh, good uh, breakout thanks, session, please. everyone. So she, Clemens is helping by taking notes of this session uh, so we can concentrate on, on what we want to say. Uh, next on my screen is uh, Chikumbuso. Hi, good morning from Malawi, Lilongwe, to be specific. My name is Chikumbuso Kilembe. I work for the Irish Embassy here in Lilongwe and I'm the Resilience Advisor. Uh, and, and I should say that uh, my interest has been on working on uh, working with smallholder farmers build resilience, but also uh, you know the environment in Malawi is that uh, we have uh, high poverty rates, and uh, we've been working with social cash transfer beneficiaries to ensure that they graduate and uh, and that uh, they are reliant, self reliant. So. Uh, that's my interest and, and um, I'm very happy to join. Thank you so much. Super, thank you. Uh, we were in Malawi introducing adaptation technology as a concept two years ago in Lilongwe at the motel, Crossroads Motel on the outside of Lilongwe and it was a very exciting conference, I tell you. Ellie, you're oh, the great. right screen. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ellie Blackwood. I work um, for the state government of Victoria in Australia um, in the adaptation policy area there. Um, it's 
fascinating listening in um, and perhaps getting out of my little Victorian bubble and hearing such a broad international perspective on um, community-based adaptation issues. The work I do with the state government is um, supporting um, regional communities, um, you know, and supporting more of a kind of place-based approach to um, adaptation. So, um, yeah, that's the work I do. Thanks. Just as a clarification, when you say regional communities, are you talking Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, or? No, no, I'm talking about the um, the regions, regional Australia. Okay, so it's within Australia, it's adaptation within Australia, which is very, mm. so it's challenging those communities. That very interesting. Eliza. Mm. Yeah. So, um, good afternoon. It's afternoon here in the Philippines. Uh, I'm Elisa from Philippine Red Cross. I was working uh, as Neil and I am, um, but I also doing some volunteer works, um, advocating in protection and conservation. Actually, uh, we were working right now uh, in um, in one area. Uh, in terms of protection and conservation of the Mount Sambrano. That's one of uh, the um, ecotourism area uh, here in the Philippines. And last but not least, uh, Miwa. Is that right? I got it wrong. Muya. Muya, sorry. Muya. Yes, no, that, not a problem. Thank, thank you very much. And um, here it's uh, morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, Mwia Mundia from the Embers of Ireland in Zambia. Um, the program manager uh, overseeing our activities uh, with our partners around uh, climate change, uh, nutrition, and markets. My interest really is around uh, the link between uh, nutrition status and uh, the climate uh, effects and adaptation at the community level. So we have several partners that we are supporting to try to mitigate some of those uh, impacts um, uh, on nutrition. Thank you. Super. So um, obviously, the government of Ireland uh, are quite uh, active here. I know they were strong supporters. They are strong supporters of CBA, which is super. And I know they are active in Southern Africa. So maybe we'll bring some of those examples as well as Philippines and Australia. Um, how can technology developers be incentivized to help with uh, CBA? I think that that question follows directly on from what Matt was saying. Well, it seems GSMA are incentivized. They're looking for business opportunities. But what about uh, the... Uh, um, solar powered irrigation uh, you know, companies and suppliers and so on. When we worked with them, just to keep the ball rolling here, when we worked with them in practical action, there was and they were really only interested in, in farmers that can pay for the solar panels and the water tanks and so on. So they ended up being in the high potential areas good rainfall, good farms. Uh, they usually had bank accounts and they were usually men. So there we were, you know, the, the technology developers were working with the people who can pay for the technology, whereas we knew this technology works so well for remote rural communities where most of the farmers are struggling to be farmers in the first place. Uh, they may be uh, mainly women because the men are not there. And uh, I don't know, and throw that out. Do you have views or experiences you'd like to share or alternative ones? I threw that out as an example, but <clears throat> you might have others. If you can keep your video on, keep it on. Don't worry about keeping it on and just because that way, if your video's on, in order to speak, you just do that. You don't need to look for the hand up button. Yeah. Okay, Miwa. Yes. Uh, let, let me kick start. Um, just to give some examples, I, I think when, when you look at uh, some of these technologies, for example, the, the, the solar irrigation, the initial capital outlay is, is quite huge. And um, so for a private company to come in and uh, just uh, uh, push in their capital there um, might be a bit uh, limiting. But I'm thinking of um, uh, 
our governments. If you look at, uh, at our governments, there's so much money that is spent on some of the things that, that are really not producing better results. I'm thinking, for example, in Zambia, we have a huge government program on uh, maize subsidy, which exactly. runs year in, year out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, if part of that resources is, is um, tied to uh, some of these technologies uh, with the farmers, I'm sure over a period of time, some results will start coming out. So uh, maybe we need to do as much as uh, the donors are funding some of these projects um, on, on technology. I think we need to link in the government uh, resources and lobby and push them in. Um, I don't know how we can do it, but in, influence them to start including some of these technology and some of these subsidized activities. Miwa, I, I suggest these farm input subsidy programs, FISP, you know, yes. and fertilizer subsidies. I mean, they've been happening for years and years and years, but maybe they buy votes, I don't know. Exactly, it is a, there's a political economy to it, but also if that political economy can be used by the, for example, by us donors to try to show the government that actually you, you are likely to get more votes if you include, for example, solar solar irrigation irrigation system in a community and people will be happy and they will have more yield. Um, so, so it's the way we package it and try to, uh, to, to influence the government. For example, for a long time uh, in Zambia, the, the FISI uh, has been focusing only on maize. Uh, which is not very nutritious uh, per se. Oh, in that are you okay? Muya? Muya's froze. Let's pick up someone. Can someone else uh, come come in? Uh, it's Clo you're in uh, Chicken Boots. So. You're on mute, Chicken Boots. So. Okay, can I be heard now? Yes, you can be heard now, and then we'll come back to Muiwa as this connection picks up, okay. Okay, so uh, just to pick up from what Muiwa has just said, uh, for me, um, I, I'm, I'll look at this from several perspectives. Um, technology developers, uh, and you've rightly given an example of solar irrigation. Solar irrigation, as we are indicated, is not cheap. So uh, I know that there's a challenge because, like in the case of Malawi, for example, you have a majority of the population which is very poor. They cannot manage to buy a solar pump. But on the other side of the problem is that you have most of the smallholder farmers, most of the people, most of the rural people, uh, most of the communities who cannot afford meals. So, uh, obviously, their the first choice of things to, uh, I mean, the choice of what they want in life is going to be full. Now, to bring in a business sense to a situation where uh, most of the produce that is going to be produced is going to be for consumption is a little bit challenging. But we, sh we need to build that kind of uh, uh, thinking amongst the communities uh, that even though the primary objective of uh, these technologies in the first place is to provide them with food. But in the long run, what is, what is going to make sense is that this is going to be a business. So for me, my suggestion is that the first thing is that uh, we have to build amongst the communities a sense that when you are, for example, you have a solar irrigation scheme like what practical action is, is, uh, is promoting, the long term, should be that whatever we get out of this should be marketed as a business. So it aggregates as a business. That's the first thing. So Your, that way, uh, then, then uh, uh, smallholder com communities can then uh, have the appetite to to uptake these technologies and and even other people take them uh, as, as technologies that they can use and 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 they can demand for them and then pay for them in the very long run. So that's the first point. The second side of, story, of the story is that we know that we, we need these technologies. Like, like in Malawi, we need these technologies like 10 years, 20 years ago because of the perennial hunger that we've been facing. So government incentives are very, very important. We've had that kind of situation in Malawi uh, over the past two years where uh, there's no duty on uh, solar products. 
so farmers can buy or developers can then produce um, uh, um, uh, can 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 easily disseminate these technologies because government is not paying is not charging them any tax on any of this. So that that is a very crucial component, I think, because once you have removed tax, then there will be a lot of uh, interest from the uh, from the developers themselves to 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 bring these technologies. I, I, now I might, I, we might like in Malawi at the moment we cannot say that we are there where we have a lot of these technologies uh, adopted by different members of the community, but at least we see that there is a, a good direction uh, that is taking place at the moment because there's no duty being paid on, on any of the solar products. Uh, so I think that is uh, very, very important. And lastly, uh, uh, the most important thing is that we need to organize our communities, our farmers, our smallholder farmers. They should be in cooperatives. That way, that's when they can actually uh, benefit more, they can run this thing as a, a business and they can appreciate the value, the operating costs and everything uh, from whatever technology that is being brought to them, uh, either so by I, donors or by if, government. Or, if I summarize so, what you're saying is we need to recognize the business side of this innovation. Exactly. We need to find smart subsidies, perhaps, like a tax um, regime or in, and maybe actually maybe support to co-ops so that you've got yes. aggregation um, maybe there needs to be innovative business models so yes. that uh, communities rural communities can access this expensive technology I'd like to open it up to Elisa um, and then uh, Ellie maybe uh, one of the things I was just giving at least something to think about with Australia you see there's a very well developed financial sector I wonder whether there's some clever business models that enable technologies to that are expensive to get in the hands of people in rural areas who maybe haven't got the resources other people have but first come to it Elisa just to see Elisa first oh it's frozen so Ellie first, then Elisa. And if your bandwidth is not good, take off the video. It's only nice to see you if we can, if the bandwidth would rather hear you than not have you at all. Okay, Ellie. Yeah. yeah, to increase the awareness and acceptance of the community in terms of the technology so that um, it, it would link to the indigenous knowledge, the technology would be linked up into the indigenous knowledge and the technology. And from here, we we have to we have to create uh, a model that shows sustainability uh, for our uh, for us to to get. Uh, uh, for business model, models and public funds, because if if for example uh, the the funding uh, agency would see that this community can able to to sustain this technology, I would I think it's more sellable to to the funder. Um, that's interesting. The concept of linking the technology to indigenous knowledge, I suppose, means that there is um, confidence that the uh, that there is sustainability. That's your point, and therefore the funder says, "Okay, this is worth the risk." Thank, nice point, uh, 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 Elisa. Ellie. Hello. Um. So I will preface this by saying that finance is not really my area of expertise, but it is an interesting, um, a really interesting space in, in particular, I suppose, speaking from perhaps, you know, a more developed context and the role that, you know, that, that finance can play and the different players that are, you know, that are, that are in the space um, when finance comes into it. I think um, a lot of the discussions that, that we have are really about the um, recognition of the economic impacts of climate change in Victoria and having some quite clear quantifiable, like quantified data about what that looks like. And as a result, 
um, the kind of cost avoidance aspect and the, the kind of the, the risk that climate change now plays to um, business and the finance industry in particular um, comes into play as well, which means that we now have kind of partnerships with, um, you know, say the insurance sector who have an awareness that if they don't take adaptation um, on board, then, um, you know, the cost to that sector itself, you know, will be significant. And so working, working with partners such as them, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, um, uh, more about the kind of the risk mitigation in the finance side of, side of things is the, the discussions that we tend to have, um, as opposed to some of these really specific project type um, initiatives around, you know, solar powered irrigation that um, I heard some of the other people in the group discussing. Um, in terms of technology, the kinds of things that I am quite interested in to supporting the adaptation within the regional communities is very much about um, a lot more of the kind of communication type technology infrastructure in particular in connecting regional and rural Victoria with some of our more urban um, areas and in particular in, in kind of the communicating the messages that we have and the importance about getting the messages of climate risk and adaptation out to our most vulnerable communities, which are those typically based in more rural and regional areas and definitely harder to connect in with but um, that so much of our communication systems are set up, you know, online with quite advanced, you know, bandwidth type technologies um, that perhaps aren't as, as accessible to um, regional remote communities. And, and that's definitely where I'm seeing the need for investment in, in technologies to support this work. But So that is probably more about public in funds to provide public goods yeah communication and messaging um, mm -hmm. i think this is we've got about eight minutes left i want to go around again everybody i think we've discussed really well about like the investment side of of things number two is about how can we improve the business case for publicans mm -hmm. that's what you were talking about ellie i think mm -hmm. the the business models for private funds is probably a little bit about uh, the suggestions that were coming from um, uh, Chicken Butso uh, with these sort of specific examples. Um, although I still think we are focusing a lot on public funds, so even like support for cooperatives, uh, removing the tax, is a little bit of incentives using public funds. I, I think we need to explore a little bit more about smallholder farmers own investments, you know, ways of mitigating risk for them, maybe having models that have a contribution of public and private finance, but there is a private finance angle where smallholder farmers are themselves investing. But I did like the idea from uh, Elisa about linking these technologies to indigenous knowledge, and that would be a way that, you know, the the people in the in rural and marginal communities with little money and time are using their own resources. So quick round and quick fire round, one minute each, say, so we all get a chance to say, in particular, focus on business models, private investment, or message we might want to put back in plenary, okay? Chicken, you, you had your hands up, chicken butter first, and then we'll go around, we are we, we next, and then the other, you are the two as well. Okay. Okay. Th thanks, um, uh, Chris. Uh, you you've mentioned uh, quite a very relevant point uh, that I forgot to talk about earlier. Okay. We have a movement in Malawi. I mean, uh, we have what we've been seeing: village savings and loans groups in communities. So, the way these uh, have been operating, uh, we've seen they generate quite a lot of of money. Not not necessarily a lot, huge amounts of money, but they are relevant amounts. So uh, for me, uh, I think if you can empower these village savings and loans groups, uh, they develop very good constitution. Their savings is, is, is quite nice. Their investments within the communities, very nice. Say they've, they, they've uh, generated at the end of the year, say $1,000, just a hypothetical example. Then 
a private financier should match match the the amount that they've raised if if that can happen Absolutely. then it means uh you have a situation where i mean this will be really energized to 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 run whatever they've been running uh, whether it's a business uh, a casual business or anything with a lot of vigor and and and, and then they can generate more I, money I they think have they have an uh, appreciation of what can that's a great know. point, Chigambu. So, and we must record that. And I think it links up and resonates with what Muya was saying about cooperatives, actually. Muya, a minute from you. What would you think is the sort of highlight point that we should be thinking about action on, also mentioning in plenary? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll give you pr a practical example of a, mod a business model that we're using in Zambia. There's a pr um, um, an NGO that is promoting that model, but linking private companies to smallholder farmers. Uh, so what they do, for example, on the uh, plowing side, on the tractor, they will identify one smallholder farmer who is progressive in an area. Then they link him to a company that uh, sells tractors. So he'll get that tractor on a loan with a, with a guarantee from, from that NGO. And then he, that progressive farmer in that area, he will use that tractor to plow the fields for the other farmers around him and charge them. And then that's the money that he gets to pay back the, lo the loan. That's a uh, practical business model. That is a, yeah. it's a business model yeah. where you've got your finance model incorporated in that model and it is using a technology. It does worry yes. me plowing more land in an area which is susceptible to drought because sometimes it just- Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm giving you an example of that. So, so if we translate it into some other technology or equipment, yeah. for example, a farmer, a progressive farmer could be given a, a, an access to facilities on solar system and then he can um, use the water coming out of there to charge the neighbors and uh, the neighbors would grow in crops and, and so, so that can be thought through and replicated in a much more adaptable technologies and Thank you. scaled up. One thing, by the way, I hate to say it, this technology of the Zoom breakout rooms is very rude. It just cuts you off when time's up. So I'm going to go to Elisa so that we have a chance to hear back from Elisa. Key points. That you Actually, the key points only is to integrate the indigenous knowledge and technology to create a greater solution in CBA. It is a very... Thank you important to remind us of that, Elisa, and uh, I think the, there are practicalities linked to confidence and sustainability. Um, Ellie. So sorry, I had to take a work call. <laughs> it's 5pm um, in Australia and things are still wrapping up in the work day. Um, apologies if I'm missing the brief of the question, but I think it was just a, a final point to wrap up on. Um, obviously, yeah, so obviously kind of working for government here, the, um, most of the issues I deal with is, you know, we obviously have quite, a, you know, a reliance on the kind of public funding for adaptation and a really big question is about how we can further incentivize um, other sources of finance and investment to support the extremely costly, um, you know, issue that is um, adaptation. Um, what I continually come up, come up against is how you actually kind of can create a viable business case for investing in adaptation when um, a most of the cost is the financial gain is around about is more about cost avoidance as opposed to necessarily kind of income generation so much easier for my kind of counterparts in the mitigation side of things to kind of make the, the kind of investment case um, so yeah that's that's really the part that I'm really interested in um, recognizing adaptation is costly so there, mm. a lot of the issues are around risk avoidance. I think mm. it's an important point to take back to plenary. So I think you all have done. I've got that one from Ellie. I've got about the indigenous knowledge uh, linked to confidence and sustainability, and we can use that to develop these business models. From um, both Miwe and Chikambu, so I can tell you both work for uh, is it Irish aid? <laughs> but they very much talk about innovative, I think, business models and financing models. I really love the points that, you know, there's all this FISP money, this farm input subsidy programs money, 
which actually means that there are public funds that could be used and they could be directed better towards adaptation and enabling the uptake of adaptation technology, perhaps by reducing risk. So I'm quite happy with what I'm going to say back. I picked up those three key points. Does uh, anybody think I've missed anything? Uh, we've managed time really well. Uh, I'm expecting us to be kicked out. Um, I don't understand why I've not been, because according to my, oh, there it comes, we're being told to leave. Ah. Welcome uh, everyone to the breakout session. Um, while we are waiting for the others, maybe we can just uh, be reminded of uh, the conversation, um, you know, the conversation mapping questions, but it doesn't mean that if you have any other new uh, information or any experiences which can also assist in answering those questions, they won't be welcome. So um, the conversation mapping is that um, what do we need to do in order to bring uh, more investor confidence for them to invest into, you know, uh, community-based adaptation technologies and also what kind of business models or business cases can we build which can enable this facility or this uh, these interventions to be more accessible for the most marginalized and most vulnerable communities. So basically those are the conversation mapping questions which we have. And if anybody has any, you know, anything to share, you can use, um, you can raise up your hand or you can indicate in the chat box and then we can get the, the conversation going. Uh, thank you. Matt, I'm not sure if you have anything more to add to that. Because I think we should be starting. If there are any other uh, people joining, they'll be joining us. Yeah. No, nothing to add from my end. I think that's, that's a great introduction. Okay, thank you. And then just to make it more interactive and more personal, we were just... Uh, appealing to any of you who are able to join this session with your videos running so that we get to also see the facial expressions and get to know each other more if you have the bandwidth to do that. But if you can't, we still appreciate uh, your presence so that we can then just continue. So I'm not sure if there's anyone who's able to you know, get the conversation going uh, based on the Ignite sessions. They might have also given you some ideas as people, were, as presenters were sharing some of their experiences. How do you think all those uh, experiences, all those technologies can, can be better improved in terms of attracting um, private sector funding or even getting public sector money more organized and more coordinated. Is there anybody who wants to give it a go? Okay, we have, uh, before we go, sorry, can we just give ourselves a round of introductions? Apologies for that. I'll give uh, each one a minute. If you want to switch on your video, uh, introduce yourself, uh, say what you do, and just share a bit, just within a minute of your interest. Uh, that will be okay. Maybe Matt can get us going. <laughs> sure. And apologies in advance. My, my little one's waking up now, so apologies for any noise that you might hear in the background. But um, yeah, I've, I've already introduced myself on the on, on the last session, but uh, uh, like I said, I'm, I lead the research activities for GSMA's clean tech team. So we're a new team that's looking at how digital technology can support climate action. Um, and we work really closely with our members, so lots of mobile operators and other tech companies to explore how they can leverage their, not just funds, but also their internal expertise about developing technology to have a positive impact. So it's a really interesting space. Um, we're about to launch a new project in Kenya, which will explore how we can 
um, provide um, funds to community forest associations that are managing forests. So this is a really interesting conversation for me. So really delighted to be part of this and to learn from the experts. <laughs> it is. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for that. Uh, can I ask Kathleen to introduce herself? Thank you. Welcome. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My hi. name is Kathleen. Mm -hmm. um, Morning. I work with the National Environment Trust Fund, which is a government agency. Yeah. Uh, as the name suggests, we have a trust fund where um, uh, other governments, multilateral, bilateral, uh, corporate organizations, individuals, um, NGOs, whoever can give money um, yeah. to the government of Kenya for environmental activities and climate change activities. So just listening to Matt, I think uh, we may have a possibility of collaborating. And I'm really happy and um, uh, glad to be part of this discussion. I am a resource mobilization officer in the organization. Mm -hmm. And so mine is um, to bring resources, both technical okay. and financial. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's an interesting role you play. Uh, and I am positive we're going to be learning a bit uh, from your experiences in the environment area. Thank you so much. Uh, can I please ask Coringo, sorry if I, I pronounce it wrong, to introduce? Yes, uh, yeah. I'm happy that background has worked. So uh, <laughs> It's a beautiful <laughs> background. <laughs> that is uh, Abu Dhabi. So um, my name is Obed Coringo. Mm -hmm. I work with Care International, uh, okay. Nairobi. And uh, my role is a uh, civil society advocacy coordinator. I coordinate uh, the Southern Voices on Adaptation uh, uh, Community of Practice, which okay. encompasses Southern Voices, I mean, Southern CSOs from Africa and Asia yep. that are working in uh, climate change advocacy. Oh, nice. My interest in this uh, topic is uh, I'm, I'm doing my second master's actually in uh, uh, environmental policy. And my, my thesis topic has just been approved and is on uh, efficacy of ICT in the realization of climate uh, resilience in Kenya. Okay. So I'm looking for, um, I have a special interest in this and uh, maybe I'm happy that Matt has said that uh, they want to implement a project in Kenya. So I'm, I'm keen maybe to <laughs> tapping into the, maybe the lessons and maybe the literature from what we've already done. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's interesting. I think I will be reaching out to you as well because uh, in Zimbabwe, I'm also involved in policy. We're also involved in policy as practical action. And currently, ah, nice. currently we are leading on sharing on the implementation, you know, coming up with an implementation matrix for the new agriculture policy. For the past year, mm. Zimbabwe didn't have an agriculture policy. We were, div we were operating on... Um, on a draft. So uh, thank you. Yes. I'll, thank so, uh, you for that. I'll be contacting you. Thank you. Lamel, it's good to have you back again. I noticed you were in the other session and I was also your facilitator as well. Thank you for coming back. Uh, can you just please introduce yourself to the rest oh, of the team? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah in this group again. <laughs> Hi, hello all. It's Lal Minuagle. I'm from Nepal. I'm working with Clean Energy Nepal and my work is basically focused on climate change advocacy. Okay. Thank you. And I'm here to, I'm happy to uh, listen more in this session. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that. But I would encourage everyone to share from their different perspectives in terms of how really can we influence uh, coordinated financing from the private sector and how can we uh, even attract them? Because I know even when you're doing advocacy work, you, there's also need for you to get some funding so that you can be able to roll it out, you know, the policies. So I would really appreciate if people are able to share their experiences to, to help uh, the community of practice to see how we can uh, better improve. Yeah. Yes, Kathleen, anything to say? I'm now being a school teacher, picking on people. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's, uh, I was hoping that we'd first have um, some form of discussion because um, I would speak for NetFund. Um, as I mentioned, we're a government agency mm -hmm. and um, uh, our role is to mobilize resources. So 
so we get this we are also trying to get it from the private sector and okay. it's been um um there's been success stories and others and uh, no. what we do um the best um example i could give you is uh, one of the things that nepan does is um promoting uh, nature-based solutions um so their adoption and uptake across the country okay. and um we go through by identifying them and then um supporting them to uh develop uh, or scale up the initiatives through product development and also business development services so once we get um these uh, enterprises we try to help them through business incubation services for them to um operate like a uh, small enterprises okay. and then from there it's easier to leverage on private sector funding because um private sector funding what have come to realize is one they are for profits Mm -hmm. um their core business is profit and then yep. secondly people and um uh, <laughs> planet if if they are very cautious so yep. if they are able to make money from these adaptive um, solutions they would be more willing to listen so the best way to do is uh, some of these investors we have approached them mm -hmm. is for them to take equity in um these enterprises that we've supported so netan acts as a bridge uh between the community group and then the private sector uh, depending on the kind of um, okay. uh scale that they may have uh, we have one story um is called is a young man called Magira mm -hmm. he is producing um electricity from hydro so he's generating is okay. in mini hydro um interesting fact about him is he didn't go to is not well learned so he was just a school dropout okay. um and then but he's um creative and i don't know how that works but uh it's one of those <laughs> uh, amazing stories so yeah. from no background in um engineering or whatever he was able to generate um, electricity from his because he comes from a rural area where there are a lot of waterfalls so he oh. took advantage of that from studying how a bicycle works so he used a dynamo and generated power so when netfund identified him we supported him to patent his innovation uh, register make it a business and through interactions with various uh, development partners and part, uh, private sector were able to link him with the belgian um, private uh, company that were also interested in hydro and from there he's been now able to scale up his initiative and he currently reaches over 500 uh, people Wow. And, um they're in a partnership so i think one key thing for leveraging private sector financing first is that um they have to get their interest or rather you have to meet their interest okay. for them to be interested and um it it also helps uh, and maybe this is subjective but it helps that when you have the government in part of the partnership because with the government they are able to subsidize some of the costs so there might be some other incentives for the private sector to adapt or to tech um or be interested in this uh, kind of uh, technologies wow that's a very interesting story and very insightful i will uh, share some link to the story for the rest that, of you that will be most appreciated thank you kathleen thank you oh but do you have anything long money yeah um i i think uh Kathleen uh, already touched on most of what I wanted to say especially in terms of uh, establishing incubation centers for these technologies uh, apart from netfund I think uh, I'm sure Kathleen you know the climate innovation center uh, in Kenya which also does more or less the same supporting um, business startups uh, and, and of course ensure that they have a business case and 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 linking them uh, also with the various um i mean uh, institutions uh, which are able to ensure that of course the technologies are work mm -hmm. and and are able to address uh, the climate uh, change uh, um, i mean the issues or that that while at the same time of course uh, ensuring that of course they they generate funds oh but if i can just stop you there sorry how do you go about uh, identifying uh, these incubation centers do you go out into the communities and find out uh, what activities are happening for you to be able to identify which kind of idea to incubate and work on how do you do it uh, 
what what I've, I've seen uh, the Climate Innovation Center do is to call for applications okay. on, on various uh, topics and people who have uh -huh. maybe are able to apply and showcase. So they provide a platform uh, for them to showcase their technologies oh, no. and, and they choose uh, the best based on, on the proposal that they provide and also, uh, I mean, what they're able to offer and, and how promising they are. I'm, I'm sure Kathleen is also, uh, should be able to respond to that. Uh, well, they do that, I, I don't do that, but I'm sure Kathleen, uh, they're doing that directly. So maybe if, if you have anything to respond to that, please go ahead. Um, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we do almost what uh, Kenya CST does. Uh, we call out, um, we roll out a call for application, but because um, uh, we also target the bottom of the pyramid um, kind of um, group in the society because of course um, they are the most uh, marginalized. Uh, what we go beyond that and we have a comprehensive uh, what we call scouting strategy. So we go to the various counties. Um, just for your information, Kenya is divide, is, um, has a devolved kind of uh, government system. So we have the okay. national government and the county government. So we send out scouts to all counties uh, for them to go to the communities and uh, identify the kind of um, initiatives that exist. Okay. Things we look at um, are renovation and their socioeconomic impact and environmental impact as well. So, and the commercial viability, uh, because some are just um, um, good ideas, uh, but may not be very commercially viable. So for such, uh, we call we um, have grants uh, that we give them to scale up the initiatives if they are not going to really be business oriented. Okay. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you for sharing that. Sorry, Obed, I I disturbed you in the middle of uh, sharing. Apologies. Oh, no, it's good to hear from the horse's mouth. So glad to be here to assist. You have to forgive me. I have to go off video for a while. I'm being told my yes. bandwidth is low at the moment, but please continue. Thank you. Go ahead, Obert. Yeah, uh, maybe another, one, one other um, uh, challenge is I think of uh, uh, that maybe the private sector is facing in terms of investing in climate adaptation technologies. Uh, is, is the issue of the risks that are associated yeah. uh, with with climate change True. And, and 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 some of these uncertainties really make it difficult uh, for them to invest in in, in climate adaptation so um, the issue of uh, insurance uh, also uh, comes in handy where if maybe as an incentive if if the maybe the government is a, should provide such insurance the services and 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 and, and um, assures them that in case of, of anything, maybe they'll be able to handle the risks that come with it. I think this can also make it easier for the private sector to invest. Okay. Hmm. No, thanks uh, for sharing. Uh, if we can hear something from Laman, um, quiet. Sorry, Maria. Okay, uh, go before... ahead. Catherine. It's okay. okay guys, just to add to on what uh, Corinne has mentioned about uh, de-risking. The other thing that I think is important even for the small um, businesses and the community based um, is for them to be de-risked. And that's why I think um, government funding or government support is important because um, we could come in to de-risk um, some of these uh, enterprises so that by the time an investor comes, mm -hmm. we've minimized the risk. So okay. at least at NetFund, uh, although with limited resources, I must insist that we have limited resources, um, we give them some form of seed capital for them to okay. start uh, de-risking some of, um, or setting up some of these structures to minimize um, uh, their what do you call it? Um, the chances of them are not surviving. So yeah. we try to increase that. And um, lastly, um, in terms of, uh, besides insurance that Corinne has mentioned, which I think is important, is also we need um, to champion for policies that um, can incentivize the private sector um, to invest in this. Because even as a nation, we might need um, large scale private sector investors. Mm -hmm. So if the government uh, uh, can, have good 
uh, or favorable uh, fiscal, mainly fiscal uh, mm, policy incentives, yes, yeah. then we would be able to attract this. Uh, for example, in Kenya, we have uh, zero tax on solar uh, equipment, VAT. It's okay. uh, so such kind of approaches. I think yeah. incentivizing that uh, would attract private funding. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Kathleen. So from your discussion there, it appears that government also has an important role to play in terms of making such uh, technologies even attractive for them as well, in order for them to help uh, yeah. Yeah, work mm -hmm. better with the communities. Yeah, that's interesting. Lamel, you've been quiet uh, this time around. <laughs> interesting to listen. No. <laughs> I have uh, nothing particular, uh, but uh, yeah, in uh, previous, uh, she mentioned the role of the government. Mm -hmm. And what I'm uh, trying to say is the enabling environment uh, should be uh, provided uh, yeah. to, uh, to uh, promote the uh, private, private sector investment. Uh, mm -hmm. Like in Nepal, it's not uh, particularly the adaptation issue, but in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, case of promoting the electric vehicle, uh, government of Nepal has such policies. Uh, government of Nepal imposed more than 250% uh, 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 percent taxes to import the uh, diesel and petrol ve vehicle, while it uh, uh, provides the uh, private, uh, it uh, gives the opportunity to private sector to import the electric vehicle with uh, free of uh, any taxes. So private sector uh, automatically interested uh, to bring the electric vehicles uh, mm -hmm. in the place of uh, diesel and petrol uh, fueled vehicle, which have uh, almost 250 to uh, 60% two, 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 two of uh, import tax. So these types of uh, policy can help. But in case of uh, adaptation issues, uh, we are still struggling to convince the insurance, private uh, insurance to uh, have the uh, crop insurance. So I'm listening uh, some more. I'm interested to listen if there are any cases uh, of insurance uh, that uh, we can learn how they convince and how they uh, implement the, uh, your, the the crop insurance that can cover okay. the climate. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, hear from Obet and Kathleen if they have some experiences uh, on crop insurance and how do you do it? Uh, that's the question I'm getting from Lamani. Um, at NetFund, no, uh, we don't provide insurance, but what we try to do is um, for the initiatives that are in agribusiness, we also advise them to take this. So we work with um, um, various uh, private insurers uh, because the government as is currently unless they've started another initiative and working through the Ministry of Agriculture, probably not. But I agree with him that it's a very important um, uh, aspect uh, when it comes to promoting um, and securing the livelihoods of, uh, especially the smallholder farmers who are um, well marginalized. So um, as currently, probably not, but I think it's one of the things that need to be pursued. Unless something to add? No, I, I don't have a practical example. Uh, the the kind of examples I've had they are actually project based mm -hmm. uh, pilots, uh, which really I may not want to discuss further. But it it has been uh, promoted as one of the key aspects uh, or solutions to uh, managing the risks that are associated with the with adaptation investing in adaptation. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Kathleen, or even maybe Albert, you said um, you bring out people then showcase their innovations or whatever ideas they have. But if you're looking at the, um, the kind of, you know, communities we deal with, uh, geographically, there are hundreds, you know, even thousands of kilometers away from big cities. And um, the social, you know, mob, you know, the social media kind of connections is not even there for them to get a signal on a very simple non-smartphone. It's difficult. How then do you get those involved? Because even if you put out a call or for people to, you know, showcase what they are doing, they are so 
out there in the remote areas, they, they are not even aware of such uh, interventions or such innovations. How then do we get that kind of vulnerable community to be involved, to, to get a bit of the action? How do we do that? How can we do that? Um, I'll start um, then if uh, Mr. Kolinga has something to add, would. Um, we appreciate that as well. And uh, what we've done is uh, we do, we have deliberate measures on reaching these people. Um, okay. So NERFAN works um, through partnerships as well. So we work with various CBUs uh, because they have, um, some of them have, uh, have been exposed or would know such things. So say we are going to a remote area part of Kenya, for example, the northern part of Kenya, we identify through the county government and also okay. the, um, uh, what do you call it? The major kind of uh, uh, NGOs in the area okay. who work with communities and then we get them um, through the communities. Secondly, we work through um, the overall body of NGOs in the country, uh, okay. we, uh, we work with them. We also work with, or we've established partnership with, um, uh, we have a council for persons living with disabilities in the country. And also that's one of the group that are, is largely um, marginalized. So we work uh, through the council to get uh, applications or um, uh, shown interest from that, which again, I must mention that, um, for to enable or to promote inclusivity, we translate our application materials to say Braille uh, okay. where necessary. And then we have a translator in-house for those who are, have Im um, impaired hearing um, challenges um, for them to share. And um, again, through our scouting program, so we send now a number of scouts to various parts of the country. So for example, we sent two um, to the northern region, who then move from place to place. So, say for our months, they are going from this place, this place, and learning from these women. And these scouts also uh, are expected to help these people make um, their application. So, uh, because some we understand are not literate enough, but they are able to speak. So, they tell you what okay. it is, and then you translate that into the written application wow. for it to be evaluated. Yeah. So, we try to put in such kind of measures. Um, and um, uh, we have like a comprehensive, okay, I don't want to call it comprehensive, but we hope that it's comprehensive <laughs> awareness strategy. No, because that, again, that is good. That people are not yeah. yeah, that is good. Oh, you, you actually have a very well thought out plan uh, for trying to include everyone, which is, which is really amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, I want to agree with, the, with, the, with Kathleen that, uh, I mean, partnering with local institutions really plays a, a key role in ensuring that, of course, we reach those at, at, the, at, the, at the grassroots who may be having these technologies. Mm -hmm. So partnering, partnering with the local, local governments in Kenya, which is the uh, county government, and local institutions that have local presence, uh, okay. the CBOs and, and, and civil society organizations. And I maybe want to mention that the, the media also plays a key role, and we have uh, local radio stations that speak local language yeah. uh -huh. also play a key role and also want to mention that there has been an influx of now these technologies in Kenya. Kenya is one of the countries where we, mobile access or is, is very, very high. Even okay. the local farmers have uh, mobile phones yeah. and we have a number of uh, institutions that are actually, even, even, even the Kenya Meteorological Department uh, disseminating uh, climate information even through tech, and That's we have cool. even that are even disseminating information about maybe crops or what to plant when uh, through mo mobile phones, and this this has really worked. Uh, uh, I've seen it work. Hence, my my interest in seeing uh, how how whether how if how how effective this is has been in addressing climate. Uh, uh, I mean, issues. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, thank you, Robert, for sharing that. In Zimbabwe, the, uh, like the areas where I shared uh, some of our experiences, uh, the, the local farmers, many of them don't even have a, you know, just a simple phone. Uh, 
And if they need to get network, if you noticed in some of the pictures, it's a rocky mountainous area. They have to, there is a certain rock where they climb onto so that they can get mm -hmm. some reception. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we really need to get the private sector more involved to kind of put yeah. up boosters and all that. What, what, mm -hmm. what has contributed to that is because now in Kenya, we have the PESA or the mobile transfer uh, system where I do not really need to have cash for me to transact. And this has really contributed a lot in ensuring that people have access to mobile phones. Okay. No, uh, that's, thank you so much for sharing. I can see we're getting a reminder that we have about 40 seconds. I don't know if Lamen, if you have anything to say, uh, Matt? Well, just to add, I've been I've been taking lots of notes, and it's been a really interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. It, it when you does, kindly yes. Phones because that's my box. Um, but but yeah, I think just to say, it, it's really great to hear that mobile innovation has has helped unlock opportunities, especially for reaching the most vulnerable. But completely agree. There's this remaining challenge that for a lot of people, it's still hard to connect to a mobile yeah. service and to receive information and support. And also, I think one thing. Um, so, um, yeah, I would love to have a quick round of intro from all of you. Um, so, um, so could you have a quick introduction about, yeah, one minute um, introduction uh, about yourself, uh, where you are from and um, what you are working on? Um, so again, uh, my name is Nga and I'm currently um, with K International in Vietnam. So I work across the realms of climate change uh, adaptation, uh, working with private sector and also um, business development. So um, yeah, very happy to, to, um, to, to facilitate the group work today. Um, and if you have uh, enough bandwidth, um, yeah, I would love to um, see you, to see your face, <laughs> if possible. Um, if not, uh, no problem. Um, and now I would hand over to Anna, um, who would support um, as, um, to report back our um, discussion result um, after the session. Thank you. It's very early here in the UK, so I'm going to keep my video off for everyone's benefit. Uh, I work for Practical Action and I also work on um, a multi-sectorial group called the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance where we work to build flood resilience uh, in developed and developing countries around the globe through community programs, research and uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, and I will be taking notes from this um, uh, conversation today, so looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts and ideas. Thanks, Anna. Um, no, my, I may we go first with Tia, my former colleague, to introduce herself. It is a surprise uh, for me to, um, to meet her here. So, Tia, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my video doesn't work with, with Zoom. I have these issues. Um, yes, and uh, I um, I'm joining from Berlin, where I work for the International Climate Initiative in the Adaptation Unit, and where I'm responsible for the topic uh, CBA and EBA. And yes, I used to work with uh, Nga and uh, Karen now uh, on how to actually scale up community-based climate initiatives into national policy. And I'm really, really glad, and also for me, it comes as a complete surprise to meet Nga here. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chitia. Yeah, now uh, maybe Nila. Good afternoon from Myanmar. Uh, I'm Nila Shui uh, from Myanmar. I work for K International, K International, and also I am a program director. And uh, currently, we are implementing a climate learning pilot project in Northern Shan state of uh, Myanmar. So maybe I can contribute some information, some uh, 
information to you. Thanks. Thanks, Neela. Um, we have uh, also Rosanna. So could you introduce yourselves? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosanna McLean. Uh, I work for C4 Eco Solutions in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, we work on climate change adaptation and mitigation projects uh, all over the world. Thank you, Rosanna. So um, am I missing anyone? No, right? Okay. So I think that, um, yeah, we, um, yeah, because of the, the, the the topic is about how uh, adaptation technologies can help us mobilize funds for community-based adaptation. And we have a two given questions. The first one is how can technology developers uh, be incentivized to help with CBA? And the second question is how can we improve the business cases for public funds and business models for individuals, communities, and private sector investors? Um, Given the limited time that we have, um, I would love to hear from you whether we want to uh, delve deeper into one question or um, you want to cover both questions. Shall we start with the question one? Okay, okay. So um, yeah, maybe we can go one by one. So um, yeah, based on the um, the three ignite presentation, um, could you um, yeah? Do you have any reflection, or you can share your practical experience um, on the ground, or your thinking um, around how can technology developers um, as incentivized to support um, community-based adaptation. Um, so, yeah, Anna will have to capture our ideas and, and, and we'll share back. Um, but then, yeah, this is an, an open question. Um, so please. Okay, so I can I can go first. Um, yeah, you you just have a um, um, seen from my presentation on the weather and in Vietnam case, um, we see a very limited um, involvement and 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 also um, limited incentives uh, from the government for um, private sectors or technology developers to invest in community based adaptation. Um, the current um, the current investments are more central around uh, renewable techno renewable energies or um, yeah, for example solar energy, but we haven't seen much um, space and 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 active um, actors uh, working on community based adaptation um, in the in the climate information service um, space. Uh, we are seeing a number of um, of technology developers, some private firm, um, but then they have also experienced a lot of painful, um, painful experience um, in, 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 in providing technology to support um, CBA. For example, one of the largest um, mobile network operator in Vietnam, um, Viettel, um, they also provided climate information services, but then um, they had to run a loss after long years and they had to close that business line. Um, and in that sense, back to my previous, um, back to my presentation, um, the financing model for, um, for, for technology to scale up technology and support um, community based adaptation really um, need to take into account um, what type of um, the viable financing model because at most um, at the moment, we are mainly depending on donor money, um, which is not mm. sustainable. Um, and, and how can we really incentivize um, private sector or technology developer to invest in this area? Uh, I, 
Yes, I would like to contribute my thinking. Uh, firstly, uh, we yes. need to uh, we need to build the awareness raising on the uh, benefit of the technology for for the farmers and also for the users and also the uh, private sector because uh, uh, we also need to build the awareness raising to invest private sector uh, private sector uh, private sector to see the uh, long term uh, benefit from the uh, from the uh, reducing the uh, climate risk so and also we need to uh, we need to advocate the government to government to uh, to work with the uh, private sector for for some uh, some policy to be uh, to favor to the uh, private sector to invest that kind of uh, technologies so uh, we need to do at the community level as well as private sector and also a policy maker level yeah great thank you Rosanna. so you you mean that we need different um, different level of intervention that can really transform people's awareness um, around using technology but at the same time um, yeah, incentivizing private sector, um, also working with the government um, to create a more um, enabling environment, more incentive um, for them. Uh, to yes, yeah. yes. And also the community members need to aware of the uh, benefit of these technologies and also uh, they, uh, they are uh, educated to to willing to pay a small amount of their contributions for using these technologies mm. for the long term sustainable. Although they are very poor, but the small, mm. very small amount to contribute to using this technology. Yes. Um, I look forward to hear from others. Do you think that um, yeah, it would be viable? or it would be feasible um, to incentivize um, technology developer to step in this space. I would also like to contribute, Thea, here. Um, actually, to add on what uh, Shui said, um, I think you have to really think about how to using money wisely and also um, how to using the available money wisely and in order to actually uh, leverage more. So I would really think we have to think more about, and your, your case actually proves it, you know, in cooperation efforts between NGOs and, and communities, uh, private sector and public sector. Because I think in, for the private sector to step in, um, I think some conditions have to be met and the only one who can do that, I think, is the state at the moment. So public, public funding would really play a huge role in terms of leverage, in terms of kind of um, buffering the risk of investing in, in helping to actually uh, cover the transaction costs. Because for the private sector to stay in the business of financing adaptation, it really has to be profitable, yeah? And we have to get to this point while at the same time reducing the vulnerability um, of those most affected. So there I see really a need for concerted efforts where we define what are the strong points and the role that uh, everyone can play ranging from the private sector, digital developers, to the public money, which would be mostly guaranteeing, uh, guaranteeing um, the, 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 the investment, uh, buffering risk, and uh, the communities and also NGOs actually providing um, the information on how these products or how the business this model would have to be set up in order to really uh, contribute to reducing the vulnerability. Yeah, totally agree with you. <laughs> and that is what we have learned from our failures uh, with our weather because that we really underestimate 
um, the, um, the willingness to pay from customer, but also the willingness to invest from private sector. Um, why we have uh, the luxury, why, yeah, why we're still having the luxury of getting donors money, I think it is really, uh, I totally agree with Tia that we need to use the money wisely in how we can really incentivize um, a partnership modality or to stimulate um, public funding in this space. Uh, because uh, um, I think uh, if you are from business or from private sector, uh, when you step in, yeah, doing something, you need to put the first question is that what, whether I can get profit. Um, but then, yeah, even investing in community-based adaptation and technologies for benefiting the most vulnerable people, um, private sector don't see um, this is a, a viable area to invest. So totally agree. So any other ideas on? Uh, on this question before we move on to the second one or do you want to have a um, any further reflection or, or idea to contribute okay i don't hear from anyone so i assume that you would love to move on to the second question um, how can we improve the business cases uh, for public funds and business models for individuals, communities, and private sector investors? Um, how can we improve business case? Um, maybe I can share first, for example, from, from, from our low weather. Um, we, um, we actually underestimated the cost that we need to, um, to spend to, um, to, um, to deliver the services uh, for smallholder farmers. Um, when we um, when we were still funded by donor money, um, we thought that it would be easy. But when we take it seriously, from um, yeah, as a, a business model, um, we um, we think that yeah, the ways of working, um, the evidence uh, was not clear enough, um, and 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 we did not have a rigorous uh, market research uh, to inform the development of the business model. Um, and in this case, I think uh, if we want to build a very strong business case uh, for, for public funds um, and, and, and business models um, for, um, to support adaptation technology, I think um, we need to invest both in strengthening the business model from different angles. For example, at CARE Vietnam, when we pilot uh, when, when we piloted our weather, um, our people are not prepared uh, to, to run a business model because our people were still in a mindset that they run a, a normal development project. And in that sense, people lack skills um, and capacities um, to make it a viable um, business cases. At the same time, um, our internal corporate system are not fit for purpose because we need to go yeah we need to go through different processes and policy um, why um, as a business model we need to be more agile more nimble more flexible for example um, so yeah just to set some idea and, and i would love to hear from you i think um we all need to kind of as you said analyze better what the conditions for business model in a specific context are to function well um 
And as you said, one, one thing I always grapple with is um, about, uh, for example, if we talk about business model of a existing uh, private sector firm, um, how, how to, to get a profit margin that will actually incentivize to first start, even though we talked about it, that with leverage money, we could actually buffer the first phase. But in, on the long run, there would have to be a profit margin. And usually when working with communities, um, local communities, the profit margin is very small. So you have to think about the only way to buffer that from a business angle is to actually scale it out really widely. So you have small amounts, but these amounts, if you have many of them, of course they, they, they add up. So this is always something that I think hinders the business model, which, which is the, the relatively small scale coupled with small profit margins. The other way of thinking business model, of course, is thinking how community members themselves can get involved to actually set up a business model that actually um, contributes to, to, to adaptation. And I think there we also have to, to put a lot of work in to actually explore that because there the profit margins would not have to be so high. So the question would be whether we could kind of combine these, these two levels like micro enterprises on the community level with um, the involvement of uh, existing private sector firms. Yeah, makes sense. And I think that it is important. Um, and, and also related to the profit margin that you mentioned here, I think, um, yeah, we, um, when we look at, uh, for example, at our field forward experience with other weather, um, we also need to demonstrate uh, better our value proposition for farmers um, because still by the end of the day they do not see the, the, the values of money that they invest into the advisory services um, and, and, and when, when they get it for free from donor funded development project they are excited but then they, when they are requested to pay money to receive the same thing um, yeah, from yeah, but yeah, they have to pay and then they said that, oh, um, the benefit that they get is not mm. equal to the money that they invest. And in that sense, mm. combined, you yeah, compounded by the, by their, um, by their status of poverty and, 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 and uh, remoteness and, and, yeah, many other issues, um, the business models completely, um, Unworkable. <laughs> mm. Yes. Mm. So, um, so that is something that we need to take into account between uh, local people or farmers or anyone who are super excited with your project as a donor funded development project. But then if you are doing the same thing for them and requesting them to pay, uh, it will be totally different. And even, even when they express that they are willing to pay when we, when we do the research or when we ask them, um, it is still a big gap between uh, what they mean by willingness to pay and then when they actually put the money out of their pocket. Hmm. So I will hmm. continue from the uh, Tia, Tia discussion. Tia discussion. Uh, uh, she's saying the business model before business uh, models is developed uh, we need to do research which uh, which is really a need from the community side so based on based on the research uh, we need to develop the business model and then uh, we need to pilot it so from the uh, we need to start with the piloting piloting because uh, the, when we implement and are piloting uh, we will be knowing something new or something some evidence so it will be useful for the uh, 
when we go for long term, uh, we can use the evidence and also learning from the pilot, we can integrate uh, the best practice or good things or challenges we can address in for long term, uh, uh, long term model. Yeah, agree with you, Neela. Um, any any um, other even white cap idea on how we can strengthen the um, the um, the business cases? I think we need to advocate donors as well to mm. implement business model. Yeah. Because each donor will interest this kind of model. Uh, they can contribute their are, they are many to developing this kind of a model. It can be uh, can it can be the you know uh, supporting for the uh, long term can move to the long term investment from the private sector as well because uh, firstly uh, the donor need to uh, invest some of the uh, money to really see the benefit of the this model and then the private sector and also the farmers or the community members really understand in the benefit of this model they will continue but initially i think we also need to advocate with the donors to invest this kind of uh, this kind of uh, business model um Nia, uh if I understand you correctly, in terms of donors investing in the business model, do you mean that the donor win um, in, or we need to take a kind of like more market-based approach, or donor win prioritize um, kind of like more viable business model in uh, adaptation technology rather than um, investing in kind of like old traditional projects am i right uh, yes uh, yes this kind of business model and as well as the uh, you know um, market for poor approach we can use mm -hmm. okay that makes sense yeah that makes sense um and agree with you on 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 the sustainability of um, um, of the project when we um, follow more market-based approach um, because uh, yeah, many beautiful um, development projects turn out to be very unsustainable when um, yeah, when when the when the project uh, comes to an end and and totally on agree on that we just have a, one more minute before we need to get back to the plenary so any final thoughts from you? I was also thinking one way of, which would really be great if, if governments took that need for adaptation financing seriously and would actually put up a program to uh, pilot and generate mm -hmm. good practices or lessons learned on how to actually generate more funding for local adaptation action. Mm. All the points we talked about you know, in a big program that would also enable that there's the learning that the other projects don't start doing the same uh, arrows. This would also be interesting to see to really have a, a government-led, but obviously with multi-stakeholder, a, a program to actually tackle this issue as something that, that is vital and, and needs like a really a mainstream actions and not only pilots um, generating valuable information that most likely gets lost because it's not um, uh, defunded and, and, and other projects start doing the same. So it would really be like a multi-year project in different countries to work on that and, and program, sorry, and to tackle the issue. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I think that this is very important and given the, the power that, um, that the um, donors have, I think, um, yeah, really should invest in 
in in in um, in the business model, capture the learnings and and implement and pilot in, in different reasons, um, so that we can have a, a more kind of like um, ground truth, ground truth, right? Experience <laughs> and lessons, and make sure that we also um, learn the lesson um, and take it forward. And in that sense, um, we are really grateful for your contribution and participation in this group. Um, I just look uh, briefly at the um, notes from our group um, as compared to other groups. I think that um, yeah, our discussion uh, is quite rich. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and thank you. And um, yeah, now I'm waiting um, to get back to the to the to the plenary. Okay. Yeah. So please uh, leave the breakout room and and and, and get back to the um, to the main um, to the main section. Thank you. CTI, I will follow up with you separately. Yes. <laughs> I'm really happy to. Hopefully, yeah. And and everyone, please. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see the breakout room. Yeah. I went. I went. Um. Yeah. We get in touch with you. I will hear uh more of your thoughts. I I believe most of you are more experienced than me. So. Uh, uh, most of my thoughts might be a bit ambitious, but um, I'm really keen to hear and learn from from uh, your experiences in the field and and what, how you think uh, um, these two questions, uh, or rather, what are your thoughts on these two questions? So, I think technology experts can be incentivized by um, uh, offering opportunities for them to. To, to be able to test and improve um, some of these uh, uh, new technologies and, and to um, uh, monitor the, the growth or the, the scaling of these um, uh, uh, technologies and especially um, if they see the need or rather the, because I believe most uh, technology experts um, rely on numbers. So this is a great opportunity to scale up uh, an application or a tool um, that is useful to most numbers. So I, I, I believe if we can find ways to um, emphasize on the usefulness of, of some of these tools, that might be a, a, a good incentive. I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I look forward to hearing um, from you guys about that. Also, the business case can improve by, I believe, just the same um, on the same, building on the same thought where they need to be shown the relevance of this tool to the community more and maybe. Um, to uh, uh, more education and awareness to be created to the business, um, I mean, to the technology experts. And also, I believe if um, uh, it's more, there's more of a collaborative effort, like if the, uh, the national governments and the local governments are brought on board uh, on a public partnership, um, uh, model like someone mentioned earlier, then this can be useful in, in, in making the, the case more robust and, and, and in convincing um, the technology experts to come on board. Thank you. Is Monisha still there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Perhaps you can. Uh, hey, oh, all right, all right, please. Oh, no, it's fine, Tasfik. Um, I was thinking Monisha can take over, but you can also continue while she prepares. So I'm okay. not exactly, I'm not exactly at, uh, I mean, a technology person, or I, I really worked uh, for a small time with, uh, with, a, with a project which which wanted to uh, see uh, how to leverage the uh, i mean uh, the solar solar irrigation market in bangladesh so uh, back then uh, I, it, it was a nine months project 
and uh, back then what i what i found that what we looked into that uh, it was a that, that was a that was a uh, i mean a successful business case but without without consider i mean before considering it a successful business case we must look how it was funded so it was all funded by grants or subsidized money from government later on when we wanted to do i mean wanted to do a research on same i mean same kind of stuff but for a different uh, product which was a solar i mean which was a solar battery for auto rickshaws we 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 hopped into a private sector uh, which which were producing uh, i mean solar batteries for rickshaws but they couldn't really provide them provide the batteries to the market uh, in a cheap rate because uh, they 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 didn't really get a grant from any uh, funding sources they they got they got a loan and they had to sell it in a uh, actual market price so that was not a feasible uh, process for the, i mean for a feasible business model for the people who are going to buy from the field so uh, what i feel like <clears throat> uh, the the solar project i worked in i i made a recommendation that if you are going to uh, produce products in your own country only then uh, a person with low income can really buy if you're importing products from outside of uh, your country that's not going to happen because the, then the subsidies uh, i mean gets involved involved the grant uh, funding gets involved and if these two things don't work i mean don't, don't come in these two instruments don't come in then the uh, the the the, uh, the ultimate buyer cannot really buy with that i mean with a higher price of the technological products so this is a this is a just this is just a just an experience that i've just shared and uh, uh, yeah so uh, please uh, if you if you have any idea or if you have any uh, insights to put lights on it can i put something yeah yeah please go ahead okay for for me i think uh when our uh, 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 sector they want to invest in technologies relevant to the uh, climate change adaptation thing or any technology that is developed for rural people it should be a uh, uh, part of the rural people perception as well because while piloting people people should also be part of piloting and developing such type of, of innovation technology so that what they feel should be inbuilt in the technology it should be also also consider uh, the gender aspects uh, uh, in the technologies whether it is gender friendly or not as mentioned by uh, uh, speak uh, certainly we also need to consider the economic aspects it should be cheaper at the same time uh the technology should be simple that should be if there is any problem then that technology can be locally uh, may, uh, uh, do some maintenance repairs maintenance uh, uh, it can be procured locally as well so we also need to think from the simplicity and uh, and which are friendly for the technologies besides the financing is the also key aspects while developing and and designing developing new technologies for the rural people uh, uh, and gender aspects should be also considered on that thank you thank you um sorry i i'm not sure i'm getting this correctly but is it uh, um are we looking at the ownership in general or the incentivization of the technology experts like the companies Please, someone, if someone has a, we have two um, questions. The there, understanding of the. We have uh, two questions yeah. that were shared. The first one is, how can technology developers be incentivized okay. to help with CBA? Let me post it in the chat box. That okay. is the first question, and okay. the second question is, Thank how you. can we improve the business case for public funds and business models for individuals, communities, and private sector investors? And here you uh, go. Uh, Okay. Again, okay. in the chat okay. box, that's the second question. Okay, thank you. 
So any other? Okay, so, somebody else. Yeah. Yes, yeah, for the, the question number one, it's very clear that certainly uh, while doing some innovation, it requires some initial level of investment, some uh, community level trial, some piloting. So in that case, some development agencies, the funding agency particularly government can invest to pilot those innovations in the local communities. They can also uh, 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 provide funds in the developing and piloting both sides so that uh, the, pilot, the, the, the developers can yeah, easily invest on that areas. Okay, um, thank you uh, Tasfik and Takur for your insights. May I add something yeah. here, Kennedy? Yes, please. Um, I, there are a couple of points that I'd like to make. Firstly, I think uh, it's very essential that when we talk about uh, getting private sector, uh, we need to we be, we need to be mindful of their interest, of their business interest, and those that revolves around profits. And how do we show them that there is profits to be made for them to invest in um, uh, climate-based adaptation initiatives is to show them that investing in rural areas in these areas, um, that there is a market for them, that there is a profit element that can be made um, out of those investments. I think, so the proponents of, uh, um, of uh, climate-based climate adaptation should also speak the private sector's language and be able to show them that there is profits to be made by perhaps expanding the markets or by perhaps uh, tweaking their existing products to come up with new innovative products um, to suit the needs of uh, the rural communities. And, and that goes um, along the line of what former, uh, what I think uh, um, Thakurji mentioned about uh, the products being uh, human centric in design that people be kept at the heart of the design. So that's the first, uh, the, the second point that I would like to make, the first point being the profit element. And I very okay. much agree with uh, Takoji that um, I think uh, there is this, uh, uh, the additionality element should be considered. Uh, private sector will not uh, want to, if they had seen profits in those, in investing in those market segments, they would have done it um, anyways. So if they're not doing it, then they perceive that as a high risk. So I think the initial investments should be made by public funds or um, donor funds to offset okay. some of that initial risks, to absorb that initial risks. And as rightly pointed out by Takurji, the initial investments uh, in trials and pilots should be absorbed by public funding. That's the other point that I would like to make. Okay. And yet another, I think the last one being that um, um, in terms of um, this being, um, uh, you know, uh, affordable for communities, one other key factor is that when we when we deal with uh, adaptations like that, this is a systems issue. This is not a standalone issue that only the donors can, um, donors and the communities or governments um, can um, can resolve. And that's why we're talking about key partnerships, bringing on board private sector. And with private sector, I think we need to expand our views to go beyond technology providers to also include perhaps um, the financial sector providers, whether it is community-based uh, banks and financial institutions or larger financial institutions to help them develop um, the right kind of financial um, um, products and services that cater to the community-based adaptation initiatives. That's what I would say. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Manisha. Great, great talk, Manisha. Um, perhaps someone else would like to add something. Anybody, Sui, Sabitri? Um, yeah, while they, okay, so. Yes, um, I don't have technology things, but um, 
I want to add on that Alpuji's uh, points are like, yeah, yes, it definitely that we need to do that, like make a, like, you know, more familiar, familiar right, with uh, this uh, community's uh, level, because like in our country that um, the most important issue that we are facing was the language issues, because like, not every ethnic uh, city that understand the, the, the majority language and the major language, and uh, they cannot get the information through the, uh, even from the television, TV channels and the radio, because they don't understand the, uh, the language. And I think that like, we also need to, how to say that, like make a user-friendly version and also the translation of their respected language uh, could be an access, like even though like how much we, invest in those like technology if they cannot assess it it will be a uh, useless one so i think that like uh, we should be more like you make uh, when we are using the technology it should be more uh, like you know user friendly version and also that like we, we have to make sure that the community uh, they could assess the, the information yes thank you thank you suvi um, Sabitri, would you like to share anything? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so just to recap on um, what Monisha said, just to make sure I have the right um, information. So is it like a, a, a situation where you may need to have all the actors involved at the outset um, uh, that is uh, the government agencies the local agencies the uh, 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 donors um, and the uh, local communities themselves um, whereby you will now make use of the uh, and, and also the private sector where you make use of the donor funds and the um, government funds to sort of create uh, awareness and um, uh, education about uh, the, the project itself or the business case, and then have a, an exit strategy where the technology developers will come in after the donor funding is uh, running out with the notion of a, a market where, whereby a market will be created um, for the local communities to continue to use this technology. Is that um, the, the, I think that's what I got from, from your talk, please. Um, um, perhaps I, I wasn't too clear. Confirm. What, I, what yeah. I meant was actually to, to get on board. I think it's very important that we get on board the, uh, the private sector actors right from yeah. the onset. So it's not like yes. the donor funding would create a market and show them that there is a market, but it's about getting them to invest and the uh, donor funding would co-invest with them to test okay. that there is indeed a market. Okay. So that is, that is what I meant. So it's very important that we engage the private sector because otherwise there won't be ownership of that, um, of that cause. Um, from their side, okay. and it's important that as much as there is ownership from the community, I think there sh there is uh, there should be uh, ownership from the private sector as the solutions provider. Um, in addition okay. to that, what I would I also like to say is uh, perhaps this is uh, very out of the box and um, something that hasn't been thought thought of. We talk a lot about um, uh, you know um, uh, communities not having access to. Um, uh, technologies like mobile technologies. Um, uh, there are two elements to it. The one is the hardware element, the other one is the software element of it. When we talk about the hard hardware element, uh, it is true that a lot of uh, places do not have internet connectivity or the farmers or the communities are um, not in a position to afford uh, those uh, devices. So why can't we design um, um, products, I mean projects, um, why can't the projects already consider giving a very basic uh, mobile phone uh, to these communities so that they can um, use it as a tool uh, for information and and alongside um, give the software of it soft by software uh, it's more about um, the skills of using these technologies so that's also an important factor that should go into the project design so if we can, um, right now, as the COVID situation has shown, 
that uh, you know uh, digital there's so much uh, that can be leveraged uh, there's so much that can be done using digital technologies and it's all about uh, it's all about the digital divide right now and a simple tool like a mobile phone and it doesn't have to be a smartphone even a simple feature phone can bridge that gap that is currently existing um, so it may be very contextual. I understand that uh, in terms of connectivity, internet connectivity, in terms of uh, a lot of other factors, but where possible, I think we should not ignore uh, those as solutions that, uh, that, we, uh, that uh, exist. And perhaps this also ties into building the market element that I, uh, the point that I made earlier, that if you give uh, people a smartphone in their hand, perhaps, uh, it actually makes the, you know, the private sector solution, uh, the technology solution more viable. And there's so many things that uh, a little device can uh, do, whether it is uh, making payments, um, you know, mobile payments or getting access to information or anything for that matter. And that can be a win-win solution, not just for communities, but also for the private sector to uh, attract them to invest in community-based adaptation. Over to you, Kennedy. Um, uh, thank you, Monisha, for very great facilitation and um, information sharing. Uh, I'm not sure how how long does the session need to be? Again, please remind me. Is it it's, 45 it's 30 minutes? minutes, and um, I didn't time it, but I think we should be. Um, near to closing of this session. So if there are any final thoughts from anybody, I think that would be good to have. Okay. Yes, um, I'm happy with the information myself. I've, I've learned so much from you and everybody else. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, in case anyone has anything to say as we finalize, please, the uh, floor is open. Uh, it, it seems um, that nobody has anything to say, so um, maybe I'll just recap one more time just to make sure because I'll be presenting it uh, and you can correct me in case I've missed out on anything, but I'll still um, uh, check through your notes again just to uh, wh while going through the presentation. So we agreed that uh, uh, the uh, first we need to show the private sector about profits that uh, 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 and the market uh, available market in the local communities for them to want to invest and we also need um, human centric designs um, the uh, focus on 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 the human aspect in, in the local communities. And we need to um, uh, promote or lobby for initial investment by uh, public or donor funding. So we essentially need to uh, bring together all actors, both um, governmental, non-governmental, uh, uh, private and uh, individual community, private sector and individual communities from the outset and uh, encourage um, uh, uh, um investment by by all all actors um and we also need to oh it's time to it's time to leave and yeah so we need to bring them together and uh, uh show the need and 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 probably um we could also introduce offering of mobile uh, basic mobile phones and um uh, education to, to enable the community members use or understand um, these mobile applications more and, and uh, thereby there'll be more market for the, um, for the private sector afterwards. Um, and we, gender, gender will, sorry. yeah? Go ahead, when, please, so, yeah. we just have a few seconds left. Yeah, yeah. I just finished actually. Uh, Please point out in case you think I missed anything. Sure. So see you in the plenary. So welcome back, everybody.
Yeah. We needed another hour or so. Oh. <laughs> it was so interactive and exciting. <laughs> yes. Yes, we, we, we were, yeah, finding the conversation quite um, insightful and cracking up brains to find answers. I am hoping that we have everybody back in the room. Can you confirm, Lynn? Yes, we have everything, everyone back. Okay, excellent. Okay, now is the time to hear back from those exciting conversations. Um, and we are going to give each re reporter or the journalist or the communicator for your room uh, two minutes to, to share with us the key insights. Um, and I want to start with group one. Sorry, I, I don't remember who is in group one, but. Okay, that was us, if I'm not mistaken, Belinda Excellent. and Harrison. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you. So I guess um, on the first question, we started by acknowledging that there are two levels of technology developers. There's the large companies like Google, and there are the small local startup tech developers in developing countries. So whilst you know some large companies already provide some kind of support through their corporate social responsibility, government still needs to step in, especially to support um, local technology developers, but also importantly in critical investments such as um, ICT infrastructure that will help uh, most of the remote communities to be able to access these technologies. Because whilst um, uh, developers can develop the technologies, remote communities cannot access the technologies because, you know, they are off the grid, um, out of the network zone. So government needs to step in with those kinds of um, investments. And then also looking at the large companies that already do some kind of grants or social responsibilities, we need to help them see the social impact and value of uh, digital solutions within uh, adaptation. And then under the second question, uh, I guess the key issue that has been recurring is uh, the need to strengthen the evidence based, the evidence based on NBS in, in, in adaptation. Um, but we then also realized that there's also a need to be able to translate that evidence into specific questions that um, policymakers and investors need. Uh, to be answered for them to make decisions. For example, translating ecosystems data into engineering specs or the uh, conventional example of economic valuations that can facilitate you know, payment for ecosystem services. And uh, we also acknowledge that uh, technology also has a role to play in strengthening this evidence base, looking at the role of GIS and, and other kinds of technologies. So there's still need for those kinds of partnerships as we implement and nature-based solutions. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. That's it. Susan, I think it's group two next, which is me. You happy with that? Um, yes. By the way, thank you for Harrison for that. Those interesting notes that I was making them, note for them group one. Um, Three points, I think, really strong points came out. One is that there is money. With we, we, It was pointed out, you know, the amount of money that's spent on farm input subsidy programs in Southern Africa. I mean, there are resources. And I think one of the things that was uh, talked about was actually incentivizing, uh, you know, innovative, redirecting some of those resources through innovative business models, ones which, um, maybe build capacity at the same time as uh, make those resources accessible and sort of like using adaptation technology. Uh, a second one, uh, I think linked to that was um, recognizing the very strong cost, the high cost of, sort of many of these adaptation uh, technologies, whether it be like solar powered irrigation or it is, uh, as just mentioned by the last group, um, 
these sort of digital solutions. Some of them are a bit expensive. And so the issue seems to be all around the financial risk avoidance. So it's using public money to find innovative ways to um, reduce financial risk. Um, but then we came up with a, a, a very interesting uh, idea, and I think it's very relevant to us, is this use of indigenous knowledge. If technologies can be linked also to how people use indigenous knowledge, it increases the buy-in and the relevance of those technologies to uh, communities and community-based adaptation. And it will lead to more confidence and sustainability uh, in the both the technology and using it in the long term. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Shall, shall we now listen to the, say, the third group? Um, and Robert, would you please be happy to speak to it? Sure, thank you, Susan. If I miss out on something, please do, uh, please do add. Uh, so for the first question, we first well acknowledge that it's a difficult question and difficult to answer. But what we thought about is that uh, there is a need for stronger business models because, uh, and there is a need for co-production of these business models with the private sector. So working with the private sector, even at the design stage. Uh, one big uh, topic that came out is that the uh, public or private partnerships could be an entry point. Um, and uh, that there was a talk that over the next 10 to 20 years, there still will be need for subsidizing uh, these technologies from public funds. Um, so the current uh, climate finance should be tailored to the forefront to, to show that these technologies work. And then over time, it would be possible to stop this uh, subsidization. There is also a need for a conducive uh, policy environment. So for instance, a government innovation in the way the taxes is done so that these uh, technology developers have some uh, tax incentives. And one interesting thought was uh, that uh, young people uh, and youth are crucial because of their technology skills. So there is a need to strengthen the capacity of, of local universities to develop these skills so that there is no need, you know, when we talk about technology, a lot of it is now in apps and big data and similar. So there is no need to pay for expensive consultants uh, from abroad where, you know, there is a, there, these skills can be developed locally. Then for the second question, uh, similar to the previous, uh, to the first group, uh, there was a lot of, a lot, lot talk was about a need for a stronger evidence and then a need to communicate that evidence better. So because that was already discussed, I wouldn't go into, into details with that. Thank you. Susan? Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we, we cannot hide away from uh, the government response uh, in, in, in facilitating this. Shall we have group four? And I'm yep. really glad that we're doing well with time. Uh, okay, uh, so question one. Um, when we look at when we consider incentives, they can be conceptualised in a, a fairly broad sense. We can have a look at policy, financial, governance, but the question is essentially what we're talking about is developing an enabling environment. But I think the the what we settled on was that the incentives really must be financial based because I think when we think about tech developers, they are going to be sort of driven by profit. Um, so they are going to increase the returns. That could be around subsidised investments. That could be risk. It could be tax holidays. But then we said we discussed who should actually be providing these incentives. Is it just the national government? Uh, there was a sense in the group that it does very much fall to the national government to create this enabling environment and provide these incentives. But then we pose the question in terms of what the, can the, what incentives can the communities offer themselves? Um, which we didn't we didn't actually answer, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, the communities are often not consulted in the development of the solution, rather that you know that there's often this sort of top down imposition. So I think um, there needs to be greater inclusion of the communities in the development of tech solutions before we start looking at incentives. I think that's a that's a sort of pre step that needs to be. Place. In terms of how we can improve the business case, there was a the general discussion was that we need to build investor confidence. Um, the the government 
can underwrite or it can top slice some of the risk for private investment to, to, to make private investors a bit braver. Um, but there's also over time, there's the need to build in country private sector, uh, which can be difficult. And I think that's going to move at more of a glacial pace. Um, also, in terms of when we think about tech developers, we need to consider these in terms of it's not just about European and American hubs, but also the hubs in Africa, and they need to be supported to grow. Um, and perhaps there's a, a, a bit of a, a sensitisation exercise, or uh, whereby uni grads can take or university students can take can take uh, modules in climate change so that it's on there. So it's going to be you know, something that they're going to be considering. Um, in terms of creating a Better business case, there needs to be strong collaboration at the very beginning of any project. So this is for looking at the feasibility and the design stage. And this is closely considering the sustainability of a project for all the different actors, the communities. If there's going to be public finance, they need to be included, and then the private sector as well. And this has to happen at the very beginning. So that so the sustainability of the project and the business case can actually be considered. Um, uh, and we also need to be careful not to bake dependency into a project. You know, there needs to be a vision for the project itself. So I'm getting one minute, so that's me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Definitely a number of converging um, points coming in from the different groups, the stronger collaboration, for instance, and starting from design stage, very, very critical. Let's have group number five, two minutes. Great, thanks. Um, I, I won't take long because we had, we had a great discussion and it touched on a lot of the points that were already made. Um, but I might add that we had a particularly interesting discussion around the role of community organizations and the role that they play to support entrepreneurs and to, to act as a bridge between those entrepreneurs or startups and the private sector. Um, and some of the roles that we discussed were just identifying innovation um, and finding entrepreneurs who have projects that are worthy of investment. And um, that includes the most vulnerable, so not forgetting those that live in very remote areas and especially those with disabilities. Um, and then also th there's the role to help innovators and entrepreneurs develop their own business case uh, for their project or their, the, their organization um, so that they think like a, a, a profit-making business. Um, and that's a real uh, important enabler to attract private sector investment. Um, and then also acting as that bridge, as I said, between those entrepreneurs and the private sector investors. Uh, and then we also touched on the role of government, as, as we've said, creating enabling policies that support entrepreneurs and incentivize investment in um, climate projects. Um, but also there's a role, especially at the local county level for uh, government institutions to help find those who might need support or could benefit from investment. Uh, so I guess in summary, we, we talked a lot about how with this type of support and through these partnerships, um, the private sector will be better informed about where there is innovation and where investments um, can be made. Um, and will be more enticed to, to engage and invest in this space. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, uh, group six. Lynn, did we have uh, group six? Yes, we have Nia and Anna. Nia, excellent. Nia. Um, you need to unmute. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. She might. Okay. Oh, you, you keep um, muting and unmuting. So I'm thinking you're having connection problems. So let's switch to Anna first. And then we'll come back to you. Anna? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to, to cover what we talked about. I think similar to, to what Matt said, we, uh, what we've talked about has largely been touched upon by, uh, by other groups as well. Um, so we, we talked quite a bit about how um, uh, we need evidence uh, for uh, builder business cases and uh, one of the points that came out was the, um, the importance of using the money 
that is available. So if you do have donor funding for something, use that funding to also build the business case and collect the, the relevant evidence needed to, to scale up and um, build on the, uh, um, the ideas you've got. Um, so that was one of the things on the first question that really stood out to me, apart from what's been discussed. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to, to improving the business case, it's really important to not underestimating the costs of the service uh, and to, to really invest in uh, the market research. And this kind of goes back to the, um, the previous point as well, that to use the, the donor funding that you've got to really invest in, in doing that market research and having a, a clear and realistic understanding of, of the costs uh, and also uh, a clear and realistic um, understanding of what the end users are willing to pay and to be aware that uh, end users might be really interested and really keen on an idea when it's delivered for free and they might even report that they are interested in paying but when, when it comes down to, to reality and you are asking people uh, with very limited uh, financial funds to pay for something then that might not actually be realistic and to, to kind of um, consider that when you, when you build your, your business model. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are the things we discussed beyond what, what others have already touched on. Excellent. Um, I, I hear you loudly saying we have to be deliberate with the resources that we have to contribute to the evidence generation. Thank you. Yeah, um, your two minutes are ticking from now. Or shall we have, okay, yeah. Um, and I'll just report back what our group um, has discussed. Okay. Yeah, um, but then maybe another point um, that we want to um, to add on from the uh, how we can really improve the business case is that how we can also um, yeah from from donor perspective. Um, so um, donors should also really invest in um, in supporting and 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 um, and building a viable business model. Um, by taking a more market-based approach um, to projects and programs and, and really consider the long-term sustainability. Great. Yeah. So um, thank you so much. I feel like we have built a lot of knowledge through just these six groups that we had. And I want now to hand um, it back to Chris, who will also launch us into uh, Paul, before I'm we sorry wrap to, up. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're group seven and we um, haven't reported yet. So if I may oh, jump sorry. in. Yes, please use your space. Um, I'm sorry. It's all right. Um, well, a lot of points have already been covered, but um, on the incentivizing part, we've said uh, that using public financing for absorbing the initial risks of private sector would be good to help them um, in trials and piloting. So this will offer opportunities um, to, uh, for them to be able to test and improve new technologies and monitor scaling of technology. I think the key there is to show them that there's market to be, uh, markets in, um, in vet and profits to be made in investing in community-based adaptation. So that is that goes on to speaking the private sector language so that we're able to successfully attract them. And uh, we also talked about uh, partnership going beyond uh, technology providers, engaging all ecosystem actors, for example, uh, finan financial service providers, engaging with them to help them develop uh, financial uh, products um, so that this can ensure viability of the technology investment uh, for the private sector. Then we also talked about um, talked of the fact that the proponents of uh, uh, climate based, um, sorry, community based adaptation should be able to show uh, markets, which I um, mentioned earlier, then incentivize both communities and private sector with hardware and software support for communities. Uh, for example, building capacities of the community to use technology, but at the same time, subsidizing initial access to technology to show use case and market demonstration for both uh, for the uh, private sector investments. Um, and in the um, improving business case uh, for public funds, we have said that uh, 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 there has to be a human centric design 
that it should be part of rural people's conception as well. Uh, engaging communities um, and, and ensuring that their interests and knowledge are part of the design um, and ensuring, uh, again, gender friendly design that's all, already been considered. The other thing that we talked about is that the technology should be simple and user friendly of, uh, to ensure better uptake and local, uh, local maintenance possible. Uh, we also talked about um, keeping it uh, in user friendly language and for, in in fact, even in local languages to ensure easy access and wide uptake. Uh, then uh, we've had uh, cases that were shared around how subsidized models were not uh, scalable. So um, therefore a solution that came out of it, uh, out of the discussion was that local, um, whatever technology we're talking about, it should be locally produced so that it is um, affordable um, without grants and subsidies and can also be uh, maintained. Then finding ways to emphasize, um, to scale um, and collaborative efforts, uh, perhaps uh, private public partnership models um, and focusing on partnership uh, from local to national level with shared funding from the onset and um, mill incorporated. Uh, that would be all from my side. Imagine we were going to miss out such a rich discussion with apologies again and I do hear that we are going to need to sharpen our communication skills so that we can engage the private sector better and other stakeholders. Over to you Chris. The truth of the matter is seven groups by three or four points means that I've got over 25 really useful and really important points. So we'll have to capture these well. I mean, quite a few were around um, how to incentivize investment. I, uh, there was quite a bit on evidence. We've heard this before, the need to build robust evidence. I loved your little summary, say, be deliberate with the resources we have. I thought, oh, God, write that. So if there are resources, use those resources in a deliberate way to build evidence. And there was a lot of common sense around how we develop business cases and, and not underestimating um, costs and so on. I think that came from Nya's group. Um, there's nothing here that isn't useful. Um, and I think it needs it in the write-up. And I don't really want to eat into the time of, for reflections from um, mm. speaking they were to say well what would you do now you've heard this rich discussion what what would you do now in vietnam uh Nya? or what would you reckon you need to do now in uh, zimbabwe maria and also matt as well to ask him what they would do as a result of this conversation let's uh, let's ask that so that we have time and unless susan there is an overarching point you would also like to make. So I heard I was lip reading there, but I heard you say no, that's okay, I think. Yeah, it's okay. So, no. Okay, this is really exciting. Let's go and hear from the three, uh, starting with Mia. Um. Definitely would invest more on market analysis. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's great. I mean, that's, that's very succinct points. This absolutely central and at the key to this, and which also reflects some of the things <laughs> you've heard. Maria. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, the discussion out, but uh, what I like the most is uh, being more deliberate in terms of uh, engaging with um, the local players and also trying to see how we can get government to make more attractive by seeing how they can create an enabling environment 
it's the, there's so many things which are just running through my mind, but thanks, Chris. Incidentally, by the way, sorry, uh, are we a problem here? This question is also going to everybody else uh, through Mentimeter, and we will see your results here. To get to Mentimeter, there is a code in the chat that you can just click on and it takes your computer straight there, I think, or uh, Clements is going to put one in the chat for us. Um, or you go onto menti.com and you input that code and your responses will come up here. The idea was to ask this question to everybody as well as the three presenters. Apologies for that. Whilst people are putting their reactions in menti.com, through be that code that's on the top of the screen, can I ask Matt to give his reflection? Sure. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll say three um, quickly. The first one is I think this is making me realize that um, as sort of private sector representatives and working with the private sector, we need to be more collaborative when we uh, test new solutions or we do more research. So I think um, in engaging with local community organizations in particular and local government institutions will be really critical to make sure that our research is locally relevant and uh, helps us understand risks associated and opportunities associated with deploying digital technology. The second one is making sure that all of our research follows human-centered design. So making sure that all of the technology we develop is informed by local participants who will be using it in the right language, um, following sort of traditional approaches as, as we've touched on in this last session. And then finally, I think this session in general has shown me the importance of creating spaces for the private sector and the public sector and non-profit sector to um, discuss important topics like this. So I think there's more that GSMA can probably do to facilitate these types of conversations, which I think are quite critical. Thank you. And in fact, uh, that was one of the ones I'd circled to flag back is the sort of key takeaway from my side as a facilitator listening to this conversation about the human-centered design. So and and thank you for that. And the collaboration was also raised. So now let's look at some of these that we see uh, in the um, slide here. Um, the PPPs, there's a really important uh, role for that. I, I, there was, by the way, a comment made that subsidized models are not scalable. So, I mean, it has to, th that I think is an interesting observation and probably is something we have learned from development over the last. 10 years or so as technology is being encouraged through subsidies. Um, research is appearing quite a lot. Um, engaging the diverse stakeholders. That is a common uh, message coming out of CBA generally. And I think it, it uh, does um, it is something we probably need to do in promoting vertical linkages uh, is, is that we, as a community of practice, we talk well to each other, but we need to talk well to people outside our community of practice and have those vertical linkages. Susan, please uh, feel free to chip in and add points that are not seen. Can we scroll down the screen? Because I think there are probably many more comments. Mm -hmm. The, um, the, there was a big discussion in this session about risk, risk avoid, avoidance, and therefore using uh, public money in a smart way uh, with, uh, th that is where we have a clear outcome in mind, which isn't business as usual. It wouldn't be, for example, the farm input subsidy programs we might have seen in some places in the past, or we do see. Yeah. We are actually like close to... One, I like this ahead, one, Chris, uh, invest more in locally produced technology. That's a good one. That was great. And keeping technology simple, keeping it user friendly. And there was a point in the group that I was in about um, using indigenous technologies, linking technologies to indigenous knowledge. So there is confidence, uh, buy-in, uh, accessibility 
and sustainability in the longer term. I mean, from my perspective, I think this has been a really interesting um, session, a really useful session, very constructive session with Ways Forward. I want to thank everybody for their, um, for their participation. And uh, yeah, definitely, if I can find the clap function, <laughs> the reactions i put please put your reaction but i am very happy and well done everybody and with that i would bring the session officially to a close thank you thank you everybody thanks guys thank you, thank you. Bye -bye.